Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope everybody had a really good lunch and is energized for the afternoon session. Um, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to go until about 3.20 p.m. Uh, in the first part of this, and we'll take a 10-minute break there, and then we'll start in again about 3.30, and we'll go until 5, and then we'll come to our dinner break. So, let's pick up where we left off. I was talking about brain structure and human behavior, and how these two things are completely interrelated. <clears throat> brain health plays a critical role in human behavior, so it is extremely important for human beings to become familiar with the brain's basic structure and function. Now, <clears throat> I'm not telling you that this is the totality of neuroscience, what I'm going to show you here today. I'm saying that this is the basics. It's the essence of how the brain structure works. So this is part of understanding the physiological uh, aspects of how consciousness works, all right? So there's three main complexes, structures, that comprise the, the total human brain. The first is the R complex or the reptilian brain. So this part of the brain facilitates <clears throat> basic survival functions. It's the part of the brain that goes to work and becomes active when we're in what's called fight or flight mode, okay? Uh, when survival is at stake. It also controls basic motor functions and, and respiration, okay? The second part of the brain is above the R complex. This is called the limbic system. It's also known as the mammal brain, the mammalian brain. This part of the brain facilitates human emotions and it makes um, human emotion possible to be felt in the physiology. It does this by releasing what's known as neuropeptides into the bloodstream through different, different glands that comprise the, the limbic brain or what's called the midbrain also. So uh, the final part of the brain, the, the highest structure, uh, structurally, and the newest part of the brain, uh, evolutionarily, it's called the neocortex. Now really what this part of the brain is really called is the telencephalon. That's what we traditionally think of as the gray matter of the brain, okay, uh, with the hemispheres, okay. Uh, the neocortex is where all of the actual... Uh, electrochemical activity that comprises our human modes of thought takes place, and that's in the outer shell of the telencephalon, which is known as the neocortex. So this part of the brain actually facilitates all human functions of thought, what we consider the things in thought that make us a human being and separate us from the animal kingdom. Higher thought functions, logic, um, uh, intuition, creativity, Okay, so we'll, we'll break down these parts of the brain and uh, give you some visual understanding of them. So down here, <clears throat> which, sorry, down here is the reptilian brain. It's comprised of the brain stem right here, and this part of the brain is called the, um, the uh, cerebellum, okay? These two components together essentially comprise the R complex. So again, the R complex is the lowest consciousness part of the brain. We don't do any thinking with this part of the brain. It's the reactive part of the brain. It reacts to stimulus. It's the stimulus response mechanism. Now up here in this middle part of the brain, these are all the different glands like the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the uh, pituitary and pineal glands, etc., that comprise the, the midbrain or the limbic system. All human emotions are facilitated, are made possible by this part of the brain, okay? So um, this part of the brain, if it wasn't working properly, you would not be able to experience a normal range of human emotions. This is part of what psychopathy is. Psychopaths, this part of the brain is not functioning properly, whether it be from a birth disorder or whether it be from... Um, conditions over one's life that if someone has stayed in chronically has numbed out this part of the brain and it is not is not functioning properly anymore so the person's not actually experiencing a normal range of emotions this part of the brain which again is the telencephalon this gray uh, matter part with all of the grooves etc um, <clears throat> that's the neocortex the neocortex is the outer 
casing, basically, of the telencephalon, the higher brain. It's the human brain, okay? Neo means new, so it's the newest part of the brain structure uh, as far as uh, evolutionary development of the human being goes. So this part of the brain facilitates all higher order thinking. Now, if what you have to understand about the, the telencephalon or the hemispheres of the brain is that they're, they're, first of all, bilaterally symmetrical and they generally control different functions of thought. Now, I'm not telling you it's 100%. Neuroscience is more complicated than that, okay? But in general, the left part, the left hemisphere of the brain is uh, what governs logic, analytical thought, and scientific and mathematical thinking, and also linear thought processes, okay? Physical world tasks and details, being able to break things down and analyze them, all right? So this is taking things apart, breaking them down into smaller components, and analyzing the pieces. That's what the left brain does. You could look at it as, you could look at it as a series processor, okay? It has to go into this part first, then here, and then here, and then we can spit out the output. A linear process, like a series processor, okay? The right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, uh, governs or generally facilitates and makes possible human creativity, our emotional makeup, okay, all the emotional dynamics of the human being, holistic thought, being able to see the big picture, big picture thinking, pattern recognition, and then things like compassion, nurturing, care, okay, um, ethics to a large extent. And I would say ethical thinking comes from a, a balance between the two, as we're going to get into. Now, if this left part of the brain here becomes chronically dominant, the masculine part of the brain, and again, I'm putting these symbols here. This is an ancient uh, archetypal symbol called the blade. It's a simple upward-pointing triangle. And this downward-pointing triangle is an, another ancient archetypal symbol that is, was referred to in the ancient world as the chalice, the cup, etc. Okay? And you'll, this was a rudimentary phallic symbol, and this was a rudimentary womb symbol representing the male and the female, or the masculine and feminine, more accurately, components of the consciousness. The idea is to keep a balance between these two. When we have a balance between the two, that's when we're operating on all cylinders, so to speak. That's when real consciousness and pattern recognition is developed. And that's when real morality and ethical considerations are also created within the personality, within the being. If this part of the brain is chronically dominant, the left part of the brain, okay, what happens is the, the right side of the brain is, is imbalanced. It's not really functioning uh, at a higher level, okay? And the, the limbic brain will actually suffer that effect, okay? It will also start to shut down. So you will have a lot of left brain patterns going on and a lot of left brain processing going on. But if that's all that's happening and we're not using this part of the brain it, it equally, the R complex of the brain is what essential um, executive functions are going to be routed to. We're going to be living from the R complex in a kind of stimulus response only mode instead of living from a holistic uh, brain balanced mode, uh, which, which is when, when we're in that balanced state, the neocortex, which governs higher order thinking and makes higher order thinking and ethical thinking possible, is what rules the personality, okay? Now, conversely, if the right side of the brain is chronically dominant, so let's put it this way. The left side of the brain being chronically dominant, you have the controller. That's the, ma that's the master mentality. The, the right side of the brain being chronically dominant, that's the slave mentality. That's the I won't stand up for myself and I'll just accept everything the total new ager, in other words, okay? So this part of the brain, if it's chronically dominant, the opposite happens with the structures of the brain. The R complex will shut down. It will suffer, okay? It will not work properly, which the R complex is necessary. It makes you stand up for yourself when you're under attack. Again, it's the fight-flight response. In a dangerous situation, you've got to know whether you're going to fight whatever is attacking you or whether you're going to get out of dodge and run away. Okay, that's a survival mechanism that's necessary when there's danger. So 
Uh, when this part of the brain is chronically imbalanced, the R complex gets shut down, people freeze essentially, and they don't stand up for themselves and take action. What they're being, what's happening is they're being ruled by their emotions. And again, the, the limbic brain governs all emotions, positive and negative. So that's compassion and that's fear. It's any possible human emotion. The, the, the midbrain is what's ultimately facilitating that emotion in the physiology. All right? So if this part of the brain is chronically dominant, the opposite happens. You go into slave think, you shut down, you freeze, you're ru ruled by the emotions, and you don't stand up for yourself. So the neocortex of the brain has two hemispheres. The left brain largely facilitates logic and scientific thought, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates creativity and compassion. When both hemispheres are in balance, the neocortex acts in its proper role as the executive command center of the whole human brain. And that's when true intelligence is born. Now, true intelligence is a concept that I think more people really have to understand. People have equated intelligence with intellect, especially in the Western society, all right? Intellect is not intelligence. Let me say that again. Intellect is not intelligence. Intelligence comprises more than intellect. Intellect is left brain understanding. True intelligence is holistic understanding with the right brain included in the process. The nurturing, compassionate, creative, and intuitive sides of the consciousness together with the intellectual aspect of the consciousness. And you can see this in the word. Intelligence, right? Intella is where intellect comes from, okay? And gens, G-E-N-C-E, -E, comes from the Latin verb genere. Genere means to generate or to create. So it's the creative aspect of the personality or the right brain. So intellect plus creativity, logical thinking plus nurturing and compassion, that's real intelligence, holistic intelligence. And most people in our society are not in holistic intelligence. They're in one form of brain imbalance or the other. So let's look at how this manifests. If a human brain's left brain hemisphere becomes chronically dominant, the R complex will take over executive function of the brain and the person will become ruled by selfishness and base desires. And they will develop a personality that is based in domination and control. Conversely, if a human being's right brain hemisphere becomes chronically dominant, the limbic system will take over executive function of the whole brain, and the person will become ruled by their own emotions and develop a personality that is based in submissiveness and naivete. Okay? The, the slave think mentality. The schism of the individual. Okay? And this is critical. Because this is not only a schism within the, the individual consciousness, it's a schism of worldview, of the way we view ourselves in the world and the way we view our relationship to others in the world. So I call this the mental schism. And it highlights basically what will happen, what kinds of thinking will, will manifest when certain types of brain imbalance are present. So when we're in this schism, and again, most of humanity is, if we're, too, we're overly intellectualizing everything and we're too much in the masculine hemisphere of the brain, okay, we're not using the right or intuitive capacities of the brain, the right uh, brain hemisphere. What this can lead to in the world is, again, rigid skepticism. Now, what did we say about that? It's not conducive to learning. People aren't really going to learn when they're rigidly skeptical. This is a hallmark of scientism. Scientismists, I don't know what other thing to call it, uh, worshipers of the altar of scientism, okay? They, are, they have this rigid skepticism because they're purely intellectual. They're not really intelligent. The, the creative aspect is missing from their personality makeup, okay? Um, atheism is a hallmark of overly dominant left brain thinking because that, you know, shuns all aspects of spiritual reality. There is no spirit. The universe is a grand cosmic accident. You know, from there you get things like solipsism. People will say, well, isn't solipsism purely left brain? No. 
it is right, it is right brain, I'm sorry, is it, is it purely right brain? And I say no, it is left brain imbalance as well. Solipsism can be generated from both forms of imbalance, of believing nothing can actually be known. There is no truth. The, you know, truth is a dirty word to many left brain individuals. You'll know, you'll know, you know? So solipsism plays into left brain imbalance as well. All of these states here inevitably lead to these things down here. Moral relativism comes next. The idea that there's no such thing as the difference between right and wrong. That we just get to make those things up. They don't exist inherently in nature. You know, We just can decide on what's right and what's wrong for ourselves and make it up you know, randomly. So very, very dangerous ideology which we're going to be talking about a lot. Social Darwinism inevitably comes after that. All right? This is the idea that a certain class of society can get to direct how the lives of everybody else will go uh, because they're the intelligentsia, so-called, okay, or the intellectual people, really is what, the, what it is, uh, the over-intellectualizing, and um, will direct society because we're the fittest. Like Darwinism postulates the survival of the fittest, well, social Darwinism postulates the survival of the most socially ruthless. And many people believe that's the natural order. They believe that's the natural order, and nothing could be farther from the truth. What that is, is it's the psychopathic chaos. It has nothing to do with nature, and it has nothing to do with order. It's the exact opposite. So, this state, and, and these are hallmarks of dark occultism as well. Okay? I think I should know a thing or two about it, as I was a priest in it for almost 10 years. I might know a couple of things about Satanism. Okay, so moral relativism is one of the big tenets of Satanism. It's actually one of the pillars of Satanism. Social Darwinism is highly praised and valued in Satanism. And eugenics, okay? Because it's, if people don't understand what eugenics is, eugenics is basically people you know, who have gone so deep into this form of left brain imbalance that they believe they're God and they can get to decide who lives and who dies. That's really what it is. We will control who breeds and who does not get to breed, who gets to live and who does not get to live. All right? That's essentially eugenics in a nutshell. And again, these are all authoritarianism, forms of authoritarianism. Okay? Um, and it's the idea that man is the author. Man is the creator. Man is the God. Man will make the law. Man will decide, who, you know, life and death at any given moment. We will decide what's right and wrong, etc. That's, that's essentially what all of these forms of thought are extreme left-brained imbalance. And I was there. I was in this state in my life. I was in it for years, for years, all right? Um, let's look at the other form of imbalance. Uh, if the right side of the brain is chronically dominant, this leads to, you know, similar kind of imbalance, but in the exact opposite form. Okay? The, the brain is still completely imbalanced, therefore the person's not in a high state of consciousness. They're completely unconscious to what's really going on within them and around them. But the manifestation is generally the opposite of the left brain forms of imbalance. So if you're in real right brain imbalanced state of consciousness, this will lead to naivete, believing anything you're told, accepting things from quote unquote official channels and official sources without actually checking into them for yourself. Blind belief. You'll believe the, ne the next uh, religion that comes along. You know, we just have to tell them what they want to hear and oh, I'll believe that, you know. So, you know, New Agers are basically in this category, naivete and blind belief. People who trust government, of course, are in that category because, again, it's about creating the masters and the slaves. That's, that's what brain imbalance is for. And th that's why the controllers want to propagate this imbalance and, and keep it in place. Again, religious extremism, that's hallmarks of right brain belief. Right brain imbalance. Solipsism, no such thing as truth. You know, all from right brain imbalance as well. Feelings of unworthiness, self-loathing, accepting orders from other people, being an order follower. We're going to have a whole section on order followers later and how this is the exact opposite of anything virtuous. For people that believe order following is some kind of a virtue, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you but it's, it's the thing that leads to all evil in the world. 
is accepting somebody's orders and not actually gauging for yourself whether the activity, the, the behavior is moral or not. Okay? And it, it creates a willing slave. This, this form of imbalance is ultimately generating a willing slave, whereas this form of imbalance is ultimately generating a psychopathic master. And they're all forms of mind control. It's just, it's just another aspect of how mind control works. The, the propagators of mind control are just doing this to keep that imbalance present in one form or another. They don't even care which it is. As long as they have some that are imbalanced toward one direction and some imbalanced toward the other direction, that's how the dynamic plays off against itself. And you have a world that is continue to be kept under lockdown. So let's look at the worldview schism that goes hand in hand with the brain schism or the mental schism. Again, this is worldview is exactly what it says. How do you view the world? How do you view yourself in it? How do you view others in it? Well, when there's chronic left brain dominance, the worldview that emerges is one of randomness. And again, this is a hallmark of scientism. The world is this grand cosmic accident. All right? The whole universe is a grand accident. There's no purpose. Right? It, there's no creator. Everything just ma magically manifested on its own for no reason from a single, a single singularity, a single point in space time for no reason. You give me that one, and I'll tell you what ha everything else that happened after that. But you got to give me that one, you know? And I have some bridges to sell you, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there's, uh, there's no underlying intelligence in nature. Nature is dead. That's what this worldview is about. Nature is dead. It's a dead thing. It's a mechanized machine that is there for no reason. Okay? There's no such thing as the spirit at all. No such thing as spiritual dimension. No such thing as natural law, certainly. Because for, for one to accept natural law, well, where does it come from? You know, I, I ask people like whether they accept that natural law exists or that, you know, there's actual objective truth and morality and like two-thirds of people don't believe don't accept it they don't believe that it exists they don't think there is objective reality and objective truth and objective morality you know they think it's all relative and we get to make it up I've actually done a, a psychological uh, small psychological profiling or study you know uh, just asking people this question at random and collecting results and analyzing them we're at about two-thirds of people who are moral relativists and believe that truth is relative also, that it's not objective, okay? Now, you ask the same people, do you believe in karma? 88, almost 90% of people believe karma is real and it exists. So I, I, I'm like, I can't believe this. You, you're gonna tell me that there's no such thing as a difference, real difference between right and wrong. Human, there are constructs in the human mind is what they think. Right? And simultaneously holding in their mind the idea that karma exists. Well, I, I asked them the question, what put karma in place then? You believe it exists. What force created it? What made it? What put it in place? And they have no answer for that. You know, They intuitively believe karma exists but can't answer where did it come from because that would involve a creator. And somebody in left brain imbalance can't acknowledge that. You know, So... To a left brain imbalanced person, there's no such thing as spiritual or natural law. It doesn't exist. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of existence has no purpose other than to continue its existence. See, survival is the highest aspiration to a left brain imbalanced individual. Right and wrong have no bearing. There's, there's no point in even discussing it. Okay? Because right's what's right for me if I'm super left brain imbalanced. Wrong is whatever affects me negatively. Okay? It doesn't matter what's actually moral. Okay? It's all subjective to a left brain imbalanced individual. And to them, nothing has any purpose. Since it's all a grand cosmic accident, how could there be a purpose for existence? Without a creator, who's going to create the purpose for it? You know? So it has no purpose other than to continue surviving. And again, that's right there is proof they're in the R complex, they're in the base brain. Survival is the highest goal. Survival is the only aspiration. Now, in Satanism, it's about as left brain imbalanced as it gets, folks. You know what their number one law is? Survival. Survival is the highest law. 
Okay, and we hear about this in Darwinism too. The ultimate purpose of the being is to continue to survive. I would highly debate that. I would highly disagree with that. There, is, there are laws higher than survival. Okay? But in Satanism, they simply refer to it as self-preservation. And that means preservation of systems of belief as well. Systems that are serving the self, the egoic self, they must continue to survive. Self-preservation as the highest law. That's, what's, that's the number one tenet of Satanism. And it doesn't matter who you need to step on to do it. Who you need to step on to get one up on somebody else. This is extreme left brain imbalance worldview. All of these characteristics in the randomness worldview are hallmarks of scientism, atheism, totalitarianism, and dark occultism. You could add to that list. You know, whether you refer to it as Satanism, dark Luciferianism, it doesn't make a difference. It's the hallmarks of the dark occult. On the other side, on the right brain imbalanced side of the worldview, there's another worldview called determinism. Okay, determinism is based in right brain imbalance and is defined by, in general, helplessness, religiosity, and the dismissal of free will. This worldview will eventually lead to a society of blind order followers and willing slaves who accept their conditions as their lot in life. So, hallmarks of deterministic worldview. God controls every event in creation. Nothing happens at random. There is no free will. So, so you can never throw anything a curveball through free will. Every event is preordained. Okay, And re religionists believe in this. See, I, I like to say, my presentation is going to piss everybody off. And that's what it should do. Because if, if you're in one of these forms of belief systems, it's, it represents one form of imbalance or another. So people who believe in government and science are in that left brain imbalance. They're going to get pissed off that I'm talking about that form of imbalance. And then the people who are in religion and the New Age movement, they're in that right form of imbalance, so they're going to get pissed off at that. Good. Let them all be pissed off. <laughs> The truth will piss you off and then it will set you free if you accept it. So, you know, all occurrences are preordained. Free will is an illusion. Now, you know who just said this in his latest book? Stephen Hawking, who you would think is the most left brain person that you can think worships at the altar of scientism, believes the universe is a grand accident, okay, and a mechanized machine, okay. He, it's like, it's like this comes full circle. It feeds off of each other like a feedback loop, these forms of imbalance. He went so far through left brain imbalance, he's so in the left brain, that he actually developed the hallmark of right brain imbalance, which is that there's no such thing as free will. No such thing. Since it's all a mechanized machine and there's no consciousness, there can actually be no choice. We are actually robots controlled by matter. Hawking believes this. He actually wrote this in his book. He said, free will is as dead as God. Okay? And pe millions of people buy this moron's books, and I'll call him a moron right to his face. There's not a drop of intelligence in that man, and people think he's one of the most intelligent people in the world. You might be one of the most overly intellectual people in the world, but you have no wisdom at all. Zero, if that's how you think. And again, put him in front of me, and I'll tell it to him to his face. Okay? Because these pe people actually believe he's smart. That person isn't smart. He's dumb. He's intellectual, but that doesn't make you intelligent. Okay? He has no part of the big picture. None. Just because you can theorize something and, and visualize it and calculate it mathematically does not make you an intelligent person. That means you're great at using the intellect. You're great at mathematics. You're great at linear and logical thinking. That does not make you wise. All right? So, you know, this uh, to, to continue with the right-brained, imbalanced worldview, since God controls everything in creation, nothing is possible to change. Human beings are powerless to create change. Everything is being made to be this way by God. This is what religionists and right-brained, imbalanced people think. So, therefore, why take any action? Action is ultimately meaningless. A big hallmark of the New Age community because it's a religion. You know, the Course in Miracles. Oh, we just need to accept everything the way that it is. Right, folks? 
doesn't make a difference if evil is running amok in our midst. No. Accept it all. Don't try to change a damn thing. Take no action. Just observe. And see how far deeper that gets you into bondage. Because that's the best way to get real deeper into chains. Okay? So these are all hallmarks of religious extremism and what I call simply slave think. Because that's what it is. Let's not euphemize anything. Let's call them what it really is. This is master think, that's slave think. And if you want a world that continues to propagate slavery, you'll stay in one of those forms of brain imbalance. And this right brain imbalance, in, in addition to religious extremism and slave think, is the hallmark of the New Age movement and their followers, their religious followers. Now, there's a balance that is struck between these, okay? And that's what everything really is ultimately about, creating a balance. Because there are components to these two worldviews that if they come together, it shows, it shows us what the truth is. And here it is right in the middle here. There is a deterministic component to reality. And there is a random component to reality existing in cooperation with each other, in conjunction with each other. The deterministic component is what I'm talking about here today and referring to under the banner of natural law. That is determined. It is law. It is set. You are not changing it. It works that way flawlessly 100% of the time. That's determined. Natural law is determined. Okay? It's the deterministic component to reality. Then there is a randomness component to reality that works continuously in conjunction with natural law. And this is called, this is a little thing called free will. Our ability to choose our behaviors, to do certain things and to not choose to do certain things. And we have it. Every individual has it, no matter what position, no matter what situation they're in. I don't care what institution you're in. I don't care what, who you've listened to up to this point. I don't care what background you come from. I don't care what economic class you come from. Every single solitary being that is capable of thinking at all is gifted with free will. You have free will to choose your behaviors, and so does every other human being. Everyone. Okay? It's a gift of creation itself. Okay, we can choose what we will do and not do. Nobody can actually make anybody do something like a robot. Oh, believe me, there's people who are trying. You know? Like Art talked about, Jose Delgado was searching for means to electronically, directly control through chip implants and stimulus, stimulus through chip implants in the brain, human behavior, like a robot, to put a technology into the brain to control the behavior of the individual. And that went on right here. This is where that took place, folks, right on Yale's campus, Okay. Read, read some of his stuff. You want to be disturbed? You think what I'm telling you is somewhat disturbing. Read some of Delgado's material. He was telling people, we're going to show you that free will doesn't exist. We're going to show you there's no such thing as rights. That we make up what rights are. The ruling class makes up what a right or, and a wrong is. We tell you what it is and you have no choice. And he was telling you, we're going to show you you have no rights. That you're our slaves. Yeah, read some of his material. And an excellent book, Art recommended too, uh, uh, Jim Keith, Mass, Con uh, Mass Control, The Engineering of Human Consciousness. If you haven't read that book, get it and read it. And that's just an introduction. And many people think he was murdered over it. You know, so uh, truth lies in the middle of these worldviews. There's a deterministic component called natural law. There's a random component called free will, our ability to choose our behavior freely. So let's look at this debate that's been going on since time immemorial of human nature versus human nurture. And again, I'm getting ready to piss everybody off, okay? Um, this debate's been going on forever. Wh which is it? What's human nature really look like? What's its, what's its essence? Is it angelic or demonic? Okay? I would say it's neither. It's neither one of these things. It's not, it's not both. It's neither. So nobody wins here, you know, who, who falls on one side or the other. 
And it's a very difficult thing for people to accept as well. Because when we ask the question, what is the nature of a human being? It's a very similar question to asking, what is the nature of this computer up on this platform? What is the nature of that projector? What is the nature of those cameras? Well, is there, can I actually say what a nature, what the nature of these things is? It's a computer. Its nature is to compute information. What is the nature of that projector? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it angelic? Is it demonic? Is that projector demonic? No. Its nature is that it projects imagery. What is the nature of these cameras? They capture imagery. That's all. So what's the nature of a human being? The nature of a human being is that it takes in information, it processes it, and then it outputs it through behavior. And as we're going to see, that's very much like a computer. I'm not saying that it is a computer. I'm saying it's like one. Okay? So human nature is neither inherently good nor inherently evil, as many people think fall on one side of this argument or the other. Instead, we should consider the operating conditions or the environment in which human beings exist, which influence, influences behavior to a great extent, thus creating the current human condition. That's why it's called the human condition. It's not called, the situation we're in is called the human condition. It's not called the human nature, okay? It's called the human condition. There's a reason it's called a condition. For any condition to be in place, well, hey, what condition is my computer in right now? What condition is my projector in? What position is Richard's cameras in? They're in operating conditions. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing because they've been kept up in good condition. Okay, in the example of my computer, it has a working operating system without malware on it. Okay, it has software that does the job, that does what I'm asking it to do properly without bugs. Okay, those are the conditions. The operating conditions will determine how does it perform. What kind of output can it put out into the world? All right? So, again, what I'm saying here is that human beings are like computers. Not that they are computers. Let me just state that emphatically. We're not computers. We're like computers. Okay? We are programmable. That's the nature of a human being. How many people have ever heard anybody say that the nature of a human being is that a human being is programmable. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only person or researcher that is calling that human nature. Our nature is that we can be programmed. And there's another thing, that's another thing people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear this. Because, it, they, again, they liken it to a mechanized machine. And I'm not saying, again, uh, to emphasize, I'm not saying we are computers. I'm saying we're like them in the ways that we can be programmed. So what gets put into a person through the environment, which is called the culture, all right, and becomes their programming, determines what they will output onto the screen, which is called human life. And that will create the human condition in the aggregate as more and more people operate that way. All right, so let's look at how this works. Human beings are programmable much like computers. Like a computer, if a human being has a bad file system format, that's the first thing you do when you're going to get ready to use a computer. You have to format the drive. How many people here are somewhat techy? Not many. Okay, about a quarter to a third. All right. So some people will know what I'm talking about here. For the others, excuse the jargon for a moment. All right, I'll explain what it is. A file system format is you got to format the hard drive so you can prepare it for a specific operating system, which is basically the task controllers. It's going to control what happens on the computer, what pro how programs get launched, how memory is used, etc. In a nutshell. All right, I, I do this for a living, so you know I know all the technical stuff. I'll, I'll, so I'll try to keep it simple. So, if the human being has a fed bad file system format. Right? This is akin to the operating conditions during a child's formative years, the first six years of their life, essentially. Now, think about it. We call this their formative years, their formative years. 
like a format on a hard drive, because this is what puts the file system into the human being that prepares it for its operating system. Okay, so largely what programs the child at this stage is the parents and what they will see in their immediate environment and home and during their very early years in quote schooling. All right, now if like a computer, if a human being also has bad a bad operating system. Now this is like Mac OS, Windows, Linux, uh, ex you know, etc. Uh, Android, iOS. These are operating systems. Again, they are basically providing a platform that other programs will run in, and they're providing a graphical user interface. This is your culture. The operating system is the culture in which the programs run. Okay, so. Let's say if you have a bad operating system, meaning you're already surrounded in a bad environment, in a bad culture, right? That's also going to negatively impact the output. And then they have bad software programs. Now, these are the programs that you run. Now, if I didn't have a good presentation uh, software, piece of software, my presentation might come out sloppy. It might crash in the middle of it. It, it might not display the graphics or the text properly. Okay, so you got to make sure you're working with good, reliable software as well. Now, what the software is, is the belief systems. What the person has taken into the mind and is processed and made part of themselves. And th now, if all of those things are bad, we have three bad components. The format is bad, the file system format, which is the formative years of the child. Okay, the culture is bad, meaning they're already growing up in a bad culture or in a con culture that condones moral relativism, et cetera, and doesn't understand natural law. And the software programs that have been input into the child are bad, meaning their belief systems, okay? What do you think the output of that, quote, computer is going to be like? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be chaotic? If I screw up my system's hard drive format, if I put an operating system that is like at alpha state and it's not ready for prime time, because the development's not finished, it's half-baked, okay? And then I load crappy software that's full of bugs, and the developers didn't really care about programming them correctly. Do you think that computer's going to operate properly and give me the output on the screen I'm looking for, or output on the printout I'm looking for, or output on the internet that I'm looking for? Good luck. <laughs> if you know a little bit about computers, you're, you're laughing now because it would be ridiculous to assume that it could do that. Well, why do we think that we're going to have that in our environment when all of these things are badly programmed? See, the output onto the screen is also going to be horrible if all those three things, you know, that determine how the, the, the system works are also bad. So it will continue, it will contribute to deteriorating conditions on a mass scale. Like a computer, the behavior of a human being largely depends upon its programming. And its programming is the quality of the information that is being input into it. The quality of the information it's taking in. The quality of the information it's taking in is going to determine the quality of the information it's outputting, like any other computer. So if garbage goes in, surprise, garbage is going to come out. If good information goes in, quality goes in, quality will come out, and the output will be as one wants it to be. It will be able to process and create efficiently, effectively, not chaotically. Here's a very simple diagram. Again, if people understand it, they really get how natural law functions. And again, it's very unpopular. People don't want to look at what the bottom base foundation or platform of this structure is. Because once again, this idea that knowledge is what's required makes many people upset because they want to believe they're going to achieve these things they say they want without doing the work to acquire that knowledge and therefore understand the requirements for obtaining those conditions. So we start with available information. And for when people look at what I'm going to describe here, they will recognize it as something. Uh, and I'll hold what that is for a moment. Available information is what you're starting with. This constitutes potential knowledge. And it can become knowledge if it's taken in, if it's amassed, if it's aggregated. 
okay? It can be gathered, it can be processed, it can be understood, and then it can be acted upon. We're st you could call this the grammar stage of this three-part process I'm going to explain. Okay? You could also refer to this as the input stage. If we're looking at it in a computer model, this is the stage of inputting information or programming something. Okay? Now the next step that's built upon this is once you've taken information in, necessary information, you then come to a position of understanding it. You know what it means, you recognize the patterns. All right? So this is the second step in this process. Now, the, your understanding or lack of understanding, okay? Now, in the first stage, your knowledge or lack of knowledge is going to lead to understanding or lack of understanding. If you have understanding present, your decision-making processes are going to be in harmony with what you say you want, okay? You're going to understand, if here's what I want, this is what's necessary to get that, to make that happen, to manifest it. That's understanding. It's a decision-making process that happens within the mind. These processes take place in the human mind and are chosen by each individual based upon available information. So again, you can see, if information is held back, if it is occulted, or even if it's just people are dissuaded from taking it in, because people will say, no, there's nothing there, there's nothing to it, right? You could see how they'll never get to this step. They'll never understand. They'll never get to the, the, the second level of creating our reality, all right? Effectively, efficiently. The third stage to this process is what you do with what you have come to understand, to know and understand. So this is the action stage, okay? Each individual's behavior the behaviors that they choose through their own free will, is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes that are happening within the human mind. Okay, That process, as we've already seen, is in return based upon the quality of available information. So this is behavior. See, people don't think of wisdom as behavior. They don't think of wisdom as action. They think of it as something that you just know. No, wrong. Wisdom is not knowledge or understanding. Wisdom is action. Let me say this again. Wisdom is action. It is knowledge and understanding that has been applied. Application. That's the program that you're going to run on the computer that you've put an operating system on and formatted properly. The application is the action. When you're working in a computer doing things, you're working in an application. You're not building the things you're building with the operating system. The operating system is what's supporting the program that allows you to be creative. Okay? And in return, the file format supports the operating system. So, we start with available knowledge. That can be converted in available information, which can be converted into knowledge, which can then, through decision-making processes and filtering of that information to eliminate inconsistencies, can lead to an understanding. In, in, in uh, continuation, the understanding can then lead, through our free will decision-making processes, to be converted into behavior, into action in the world. That, when it's done properly, it's wisdom. When it's done with morality and ethics in mind, it's wisdom. When it's done without that, it's folly, okay? And it leads to more and more chaos. So b based upon these three processes, something is generated. Something is created in the physical manifestation, physically manifested reality, the real world, so to speak. So the manifested reality is based upon the aggregate behavior, aggregate behavior. No one person is creating the reality we are experiencing, okay? It's another fallacy of the New Age movement and thinking. In the aggregate, we are creating our shared reality. All the behaviors put together creates the output on the screen, or the generated result. Is it orderly? Is it chaotic? Well, that's going to be based upon whether someone took in the information, processed it efficiently to come to an understanding, and then acted upon it. 
The manifested reality is the quality of the condition which manifests in any given society based upon the aggregate quality of human behavior within that society. This is how our reality is actually created. The conditions that we experience as the daily events of our life, it's a simple three-stage process that leads to a result. And for many people here, you will recognize if you've looked into this discovery process and this creative process, is known as the trivium. This is what the trivium is, okay? In the ancient uh, traditions, this is what the trivium was labeled. It was labeled knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. In the later aspects, when they passed out of mystery school tradition hands and went into some other think tank and society hands, the, the knowledge of the trivium was termed grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar being the knowledge stage of aggregating available information, logic being the understanding stage of making a uh, using uh, processes to analyze and, and filter uh, said information and come to an understanding of it. And then the rhetoric stage was the application, the action, taking action based upon what you've come to understand. Now, there's a third way of looking at the trivium in computer jargon, and that is input, processing, and output. And then you get the result on the screen, which is called life. All right? Any way you want to look at the trivium, I don't care. But understand it, know how it works, okay? Because this is why we're, a big part of why we're in the situation that we're in is that the trivium methodology of truth discovery has been completely obliterated from public consciousness. Completely obliterated. And I ask people how many people have even ever heard the word trivium. Raise your hand if you've heard heard the word. So a good portion of the people here have. Many people have never heard the word. And if you do a Google search on it, most people are going to get back the band, the metal band, the trivium, which is not a bad band. But, you know, <laughs> but the, the whole point here is we'd ra the results that are going to come back through Google or Bing or, or Yahoo or whatever are going to give you a metal band, a heavy metal band, instead of the trivium method of learning, the classical liberal arts education methodology because they want to try to sanitize that as much from human consumption as possible. They don't even want you to understand how that works at all. And that's why it's been removed from public schooling. And that's why, as long as this society stays the way it is, it'll never be put back into public schooling. You know, I tell people a little anecdote. It, uh, when I was in, when I was in uh, high school, and thank God I went to the high school I did because they really hammered Latin and Greek into you. You're going to know your Latin and Greek when you came out of my high school, okay? For whatever other indoctrination they put into you, that's a different story. But I'll tell you what, you came out of there knowing your ancient languages. They, they, you know, it was still part of the curriculum when I was in high school. And, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I think I came out better out of there because of simply the linguistics knowledge that I gained from it. And... Uh, we read uh, Gaius Julius Caesar's war journals in their original Latin and translated them. And in one of them, he's talking about, he's absolutely lambasting one of his um, centurions. Okay, they're on a campaign in Gaul, which is France now. And Caesar is, you know, making his rounds of his troops and they're getting ready to, you know, push deeper into Gaul. And he finds, you know, when, when they would have their encampments, they would have a lot of, uh, you know, slaves of the Roman Empire that they would take with them on their campaigns that would do a lot of the, the lifting of the equipment and the carrying of the equipment for the centurions to do battle in the next battlefield location. And uh, the slaves would have to do all that manual labor. And uh, Caesar says to one of his centurions, he's passing by their encampment, and he sees one of the actual centurion leaders teaching one of the slaves the trivium method. And he flips out on him in this journal. He says, I caught one of my centurions, you know, teaching the trivium, and freaks out on him. How dare you teach a slave our method of learning? Soon they won't want to be a slave anymore. There'd be an uprising if they knew what we knew, if they knew our truth discovery methodology. 
He said, but I think, I forget how it really ended, but I think how it ended was he told this centurion, if I ever catch you doing this again, I will personally throw you, cast you into the wilderness of Gaul and let the Gaulians deal with you, who knew that the Roman Empire was trying to conquer their people at that point, which is basically saying it would be a death sentence, but I won't even carry it out. I'll let our enemy carry it out on you. That's how much he didn't want their slaves to understand their methodology for learning. And that's the trivium. And that's why most people have never heard the word. So you got to look into it and understand how it works. That's all I can say about it. It is how we build our reality, either efficiently or destructively. So let's look at some of the principles of natural law. Now, in my extended seminar, which goes over a six-week uh, class of of uh, lessons, um, I get into these principles deeply in, in, you know, in an extended form. We're not going to do that today because time doesn't allow. I'm going to briefly touch on each one. Okay? The word principles, let's define it. Principle comes from the Latin noun principia. Principia means first, foremost, leading, chief, or most necessary. It is that which matters most it is the first things that must be understood. Before anything else can be understood, principles have to come first. And this is the problem. Our society does not put principles first. It puts trivialities first, and we're no longer a society that even cares about principles or first things. So first things first. First things or principles have to come first. So let's look at what the principles that underlie natural law. These are the things that are most important. That's what principles should mean to people. If we ask people to find what a principle is, first thing they should say, that's the most important thing. The most important thing in my life. Now, when in, in the natural law seminar, we did a homework assignment. We asked people what the most important thing was to them. Very few responded with principles. Most people responded with saying that people where the family was the number one response. The familial connection was more important to them than principles. Now, when people hear me say that that's backwards, they'll say, how cold are you? That's so cold, okay? What I'm telling you is that the familial connection, no matter what it is, between a mother and a son, a mother and a daughter, a father and a son, father and a daughter, husband and wife, doesn't matter as much as principles. I'm not telling you they don't matter at all. I'm telling you, you have to put principles first. Otherwise, those relationships are just meaningless. They don't really have any real value unless they're based upon principles first, which is why so many relationships are dysfunctional. Principles have to come first before you can even build a solid relationship with another human being. So let's look at what some of the principles of how natural laws work first before we can actually find out what the expressions of these laws are in our lives, which will be the next section. These are what I call the general principles of natural law. Natural law is expressed through seven basic underlying principles, plus what I have referred to as an eighth or hidden principle, which you, you hear very few other researchers, even people who are studying this from the occult perspective, who are studying this from the consequentialism perspective, you very hear them incorporate the eighth and all-encompassing principle, which I'll, I'll get to last here. This eighth principle, which I call the lost principle, binds all the other seven principles together. All right? These principles together constitute a master key through which universal wisdom including the knowledge of the requirements to obtaining what we desire, is then unveiled or de-occulted. When, when, when people ask me, well, what do you consider yourself in your performance of, of present, presenting what you present? I tell them, I consider myself a de-occultist. I'm no longer an occultist. I'm a de-occultist. I'm attempting to take this information out of hiding. It's been hidden. The hiding of it is destroying the fabric of our society and putting us into bondage. It needs to come out and be non-hidden. It needs to be unveiled and shared widely and freely with anybody who's capable of accepting it and comprehending it now. Because we're, in, we're not in a position where we could wait longer. We're, not in a, we're at the precipice. 
Okay? There is a, uh, a moral obligation to bring this information to the public now. Okay? So, I consider myself a de-occultist. One who takes things out of hiding and presents them openly. These are the seven general principles of natural law. Many people who have studied some variants of occultism may recognize these as what are known as the hermetic principles. Hermetic essentially comes from Hermes. Hermes Tresmegistus, the, the, the thrice great one, as he was referred to in the ancient uh, Greek mystery traditions. Okay? He was uh, considered a messenger of the gods. He brought the wisdom of the gods down to humanity. Okay? In the ancient Egyptian and Chemetian tradition, traditions, he was the scribe of the gods known as Thoth. All right? He has other incarnations as well. But the Hermetic tradition is named such because it's hermetically sealed, like natural law is. Natural law is hermetically sealed. It is binding principles that are immutable. They are laws that are in operation that cannot be changed. Hence, they are hermetically sealed. So, these pr seven general principles, they are mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, which is a huge one, which we'll be getting into, and gender. So I'm going to briefly describe what each of these are and what they are about. The principle of mentalism states that the all, everything in creation, is actually a manifestation of mind. The all is mind. Okay? What this means is everything that happens has to be a result of a mental state which preceded it. Everything. For anything to exist, thoughts had to form first, and then they formed the physical reality after. The universe itself is a mental construct of the Creator. Thoughts lead to the manifestation of things and events. Thoughts create conditions. Thoughts create things and conditions. They cannot just magically manifest themselves. Thought comes first. Thoughts create our state of existence and the quality of our experience here on earth, ultimately. Therefore, be responsible for everything. We should be responsible for everything that we create by being responsible for that which we think. Because the thought processes are what are driving the behaviors. People behave the way they do because they have certain belief systems embedded in the mind and running like a program. Their thoughts and their emotions are driving their actions. So the behavior is not magically suddenly going to just change. The thoughts and emotions have to change because they're the driving force behind the behavior. That's when reality will change. See, people don't want to hear that, once again. They don't want to hear, if you want to change reality, you, yourself, have to change the way you think. Because the way you think is not conducive to the requirements for getting what you say you want. They're doing the exact opposite of that in many cases. So that's the principle of mentalism. The principle of correspondence states that that which is above is similar or like to that which is below. So what this means is that which is below uh, and that which is below is like to that which is above. It's a mirror, okay? The above is like the below, the below is like the above, all right? The above, in this case, is the macrocosm, okay? The, the laws of the very large things, okay? The laws that govern the creation, which we consider is seemingly outside of ourselves. We know, we know at the deepest level that it's not, that we're one with it, but, you know, we perceive this as out here, the laws that, that are, govern the, the large aspects of things. So the macrocosm, or the very large, the totality of everything, and the microcosm, which is the very small, or the individuated units that comprise the whole in their aggregate, okay? They are reflections of each other. They cannot be separated from each other. As one goes, the other goes. The universe is actually a holographic system. Okay, it's a hologram is an image. Okay, you pass a, a laser through it, and it then projects a 3D image. Okay, it's like a flat image, and it projects a three-dimensional image. But the 
aspect, why they call it a hollow, like holistic, hologram, holistic image, is if you break a hologram into multiple components by cutting it. So if I take a hologram and I cut it in four pieces, you don't have a quarter of the image on one part of the hologram and a quarter on the other and a quarter on the third and a quarter on the fourth. You have four whole images that only lose their resolution by a quarter. Okay? So everything is contained in all the smaller parts. Okay? That's the, like the reality that we're living in. Our universe is a holographic one. So the universe is inside the individual. And the entire universe is like an individual. They're reflections of each other. To know the workings of the individual will help lead us to an understanding of the macrocosmic laws. Similarly, to learn the macrocosmic laws will help us to learn the way that consciousness within the individual functions. These two things cannot be separated from each other. And once again, as I said at the, near the beginning, that's what occulted knowledge is. The knowledge of the occult is how the microcosmic world works, which is the individuated consciousness, and how the macrocosmic world works, which is natural law. So the other part of the principle of correspondence is that our reality is also fractal in nature. Now, if you studied fractals, these are self-similar mathematical generated patterns, okay? We see this through things like Fibonacci sequence in, in mathematics, and this is repeated endlessly throughout nature. Okay, so you look at, you look at the um, structure of the atom, and it's similar to the structure of the solar system, which is similar to the structure of the galaxy. They work the same way. They look the same. You pull back enough, you'll keep seeing the same pattern repeat. Everybody ever see the movie that was done in, I think, the 1970s or 80s? It's a short, like, 10-minute clip. It's called Powers of Ten. Has anybody ever seen this? Yes. A couple people. Watch this movie, Powers of Ten, and you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say that the universe is fractal in nature. Brilliant movie. It will blow your mind. Real short, 10 minutes long, something like 9 or 10 minutes long. They, they basically zoom up into the cosmos to show you how everything is self-similar. Then they zoom down into the cells of a human being and in the atoms that, that comprise the hand and, and cells of the hand and show you how everything is similar there. All the way down to the atomic level, okay, and the subatomic level. So, uh, the universe is both holographic, meaning that the whole is contained in the parts and vice versa, and it is fractal or self-similar across all scales of its existence. That's the principle of correspondence. The principle of vibration simply states that there is no such thing as rest, as dead or, or non-motion, okay? Death, in that sense, is an illusion because true death would be the cessation of all motion and energy. There is no such thing. It doesn't exist. You cannot go anywhere in creation where something is com at complete rest, okay? And I joke around about this. Barb tells me funny stories when she comes home from, from work and she's trying to, you know, enlighten some of the other RNs that she works with. And she was trying to explain to one of the uh, other nurses, you know, that desk has atoms in it and they're not at rest. They're like in crazy, chaotic motion, especially the you know electron clouds of the atom. And if you could look at it at a deep enough level, you would see it's like you know chaos going on, and it's all kinds of motion happening, seemingly at random. And the other nurse, nurse goes, "Barb, you're so crazy." <laughs> you know, uh, what what I say to that is, how could you have made it to nursing school and not ever have under have even considered the concept of the atom? Right. You know, and it's amazing. You know, she actually thinks the perceived stillness is actual stillness and didn't comprehend. If you zoom into that with a powerful enough microscope, you're going to see all kinds of motion and nothing's at rest. And she thought Barb was the weird one for trying to explain that to her. Okay, so there is no such thing as true rest. It doesn't exist. If, if something's in existence, it's in motion. Everything moves, everything vibrates, and at the most fundamental level, the universe and every single thing which comprises it is ultimately pure vibratory energy that is manifesting itself in different ways, different frequencies, different vibratory forms. The universe has no true 
solidity as such, as we imagine solidity at the macrocosmic level. Matter is merely energy in a state of vibration. And what this is, if we truly understand this, and many sciences are now finally really understanding this and try, trying to propagate this knowledge out into the public, we will, we will come to the understanding that this is a spiritual construct for experience to be gained, to have an experience and learn and grow in consciousness. That's what the purpose of this whole thing is for, you know? So nothing is truly solid, you know? It's, it's, a, it's again, like we say, we are spirit having a human experience. The whole universe is spiritual, having a, a, a experience in solidity, all right? That's how you have to look at the principle of vibration. The principle of polarity states that everything has a dual nature to it. There are polarities in everything that exists, okay? Everything has poles, everything has its pair of opposites. However, opposites, they, they are identical in nature, but they're different in degree. So let me give you an example of what that means. Are hot and cold really opposites? Or can we simply look at them as the presence of heat energy or the absence of heat energy? Meaning that they're the same thing, energy. And whether it's concentrated in a specific area, which would make it hot, or whether it's absent from a specific area, which would make it cold, okay? That's what hot and cold are at the fundamental level. At our level of perception, they're opposites, but at the fundamental level, they're the same thing, energy or, it's, or lack thereof. Just like those three stages of the trivium. Are knowledge and ignorance the same thing? Yeah, actually they are. Because truth is always present. It's a matter of whether it's, pre whether it's taken in and processed, or whether it's refused to be taken in and it's not processed, okay? So it's, it's just like that. Uh, they're, they're, they're identical in their natures, but they're different in their degree, okay? Extremes can meet and blend and, you know, play with each other, like as depicted in the yin-yang symbol, masculine and feminine, they need to be blended. And at some level of reality, everything that is seemingly contradictory may be reconciled. Now again, I stress the term at some level. At the unified field level, this, everything is consciousness, pure consciousness. However, at this level, there are differences in consciousness. At this level, there are things that are taking place that we need to understand. At this level, there are things that we need to set right and rectify because it does matter. It does matter, okay? So again, be careful with some of the new age-isms that get put out there. Yes, do it, can all paradoxes be reconciled? At some level. In this realm, we need to have our feet on the ground in the physical domain. You know, the con this is the concept in the, in the hermetic tradition, which is where a lot of this understanding derived from, out of ancient Egypt, what was known as Chem, the land called Chem, was what the actual uh, commissions referred to it as. Uh, the word Egypt is a bastardization of the capital, the Greek pronunciation of the capital city of Chem, which was Memphis at one point, and that city was referred to as Hygeptos in Greek, and that became Egypt in English. But the original name for Egypt was Chem. That's simply called black or dark in their language. It was the, the black land, and we get the word alchemy, which means, again, al, from, okay? It means from the black land, al kemet which is where alchemy comes from. And that means out of darkness, this knowledge will come and bring light. Because a lot of these mystery tradition teachings do come from Chem. And also the people who took it from Chem and started to propagate it in other areas were the, the, um, uh, uh, the Greeks in the Greek mystery traditions. And again, there was light sides and dark sides to all these mystery traditions. Okay? There were some who used the knowledge wisely and tried to propagate it and tried to elevate human consciousness, and there were those who wanted to use it selfishly for their own benefit and to control others. So uh, my point was uh, that um, in, the, uh, in the Egyptian mystery tradition, um, they um, uh, I, I lost my train of thought there, I'm sorry. Uh, I was talking about all, all paradoxes may be reconciled at some level, and uh, 
Uh, I brought up the mystery traditions. I can't remember why I went into, into that, so I'll just keep going. Um, let's look at the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. Okay, so everything has a rhythm to it or a swing to it. There's tendencies that exist in energy. The pendulum swing manifests in everything that we undergo, everything that we perceive. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. It's just an opposite. It's perceived as an opposite. Rhythm will compensate. Now, what this, how this should be understood when we are talking about natural law is many people will say, well, that's just the way the tendency is moving us. It's just the way the tide is taking us, right? But that's not really accurate. Okay? We can't look at these things as that the rhythms are set in stone and it has to be this way now. right? One of the things that a lot of the hermetic tradition taught regarding these laws, the, these principles, were they can be overcome by higher levels of consciousness. Okay? This one was one of them. Rhythm is a principle that is a tendency for something to swing a certain way. It's... it's Let's, let's liken it to genetics. You know, if you look at some newer biology, a lot of modern biologists are suggesting consciousness plays into whether a gene activates or not and expresses a certain condition. Well, this is the same way. There's something that can be done about the swing or the tide, okay? Let's look at it as you have a boat. And you want to row the boat out to sea, right? You have to get past the tide. You have to get past the breakers and the waves. And if that tide's really strong at high tide, it's going to be very much more difficult. You're going to have to expend more energy to get it out to sea. If, however, you were taking it when the current's moving out to sea, okay, there, there's a, a flow that's moving outward deeper into the ocean, and you start rowing that boat then, you're going to be able to do it much more easily. Okay, so if there's, if there's winds pushing along a plane, it's going to have to expend less energy. It's going to get there qu more quickly because okay, it's adding to the energy. If, however, you're flying against the wind, you've got to expend a lot more energy. It's just a tendency. You can still get to where you want to go. You may just have to exert more effort. Right now, we're in a tendency of things are, are not flowing. Okay, It's an ebb. All right, And it's something that needs to really have more energy put into it if we're going to resist the tendency. It doesn't mean nothing can be done about it. It doesn't mean it can't be overcome. It means at the time we're living in, okay, we want to make this motion go in this direction, but its tendency is to move in this direction. So more will is required at this time to move the consciousness. At other times, the consciousness may be flowing in a positive direction, and it may take much less energy in order to move that consciousness forward. However, we're not living in that time. We are living at what many researchers have called the Kali Yuga, or the age of darkness and destruction. You know, this is the, the point that resists the flow in consciousness the most. And it's going to take an enormity of effort to break down these pre-existing belief systems that don't serve who we are. So that's the principle of rhythm. This is the principle here in natural law that most fits in with how I'm using the term natural law today cause and effect. Many people, again, in the New Age community, don't want to believe that there's causes and effects, and that effects are driven by causes that, you know, come first and then manifest conditions. So the principle of cause and effect simply states that every cause has its effect, and every effect has its cause. Uh, every single thing that occurs happens according to law, all right? Chance is a name for law, a law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. So again, is there free will? Yes, there is free will. But is there free will to ignore law without consequence? No, there is not. That's the limit of free will. Free will is operating within boundary conditions that I'm referring to as natural law. It's a series of laws, actually. Okay? Free will operates within these parameters or boundary conditions that cannot be exceeded or gone beyond without consequence. 
Oh yeah, you can break natural law. Yes, you can break it. But you cannot break it without consequence. You cannot break it without consequence. Negative consequence. And that's why this body of knowledge has in the past been referred to as consequentialism. It is the knowledge of how consequences are generated by our free will decision-making processes within the boundaries of natural law. So this is the law of cause and effect, the principle of cause and effect. And I think this image, I was searching for images that encapsulate cause and effect, and I found this cartoon. I think it does it brilliantly. Most of all, because will the effect happen immediately? No, it will not happen immediately. There is a time lag. You set the cause into motion. The universe is going to intelligently bring to you, through a rearrangement of all the dynamics that it needs to rearrange, the effect of what you've generated by setting that cause into motion. And there is a time gap between the, the cause going into place and the effect coming around and hitting you. This is why the pattern recognition of cause and effect is more difficult, because it is separated by a time lag, by what we perceive as linear time. Now, if you did a wrong to somebody, and immediately you were stung by a wasp, every single time you did a wrong to somebody, it showed up and bit you immediately within two seconds of you hurting somebody, stealing from somebody, lying to somebody, etc. Would you start to connect the stinging to the wrong that you did? I think most people would see the pattern. They would recognize the pattern. But since that doesn't happen, and there's a time lag to, gener to experiencing something harmful to ourselves once we do something harmful to other people, it's very difficult for people to see the, the connection through the time lag. Most, uh, and moreover, it doesn't exactly happen in a one-to-one -one ratio like this, okay? It's more, karmic consequence is more complicated than all of that, all right? What's happening is that all of us are experiencing in the aggregate the wrongs that the human species is conducting on a daily basis, which we do not attempt to rectify and stop through our inaction, karma is being accrued. People think that karma can only be accrued from action. No, it cannot. It can be accrued from inaction as well. And that's where many people in our society is. They're not taking any action, and they're willing to let evil run unchecked. So this is ultimately going to come back and bite us, you know? And what we set into motion is going to actually topple over onto us if we don't change our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So nothing escapes law. We are bound by it eternally. You know, let me just go back. Go back. I'll leave it on, on this slide for a moment. You know, for some people familiar with my work, you've seen me break down the Matrix trilogy. And... The law of cause and effect is brought forward extensively in the second Matrix movie, The Matrix Reloaded. And the, the scene that encapsulates this the most is the, the character of the Merovingian, who tells to the heroes who want to be free from the Matrix and its control, okay, you are coming to me without an understanding of why you are in this position. You don't understand the causal factors that have led to the current conditions that are in place. Therefore, you are coming to me with no power to affect change. You are powerless. So why should I help you? You're powerless because you lack knowledge and understanding of what set these events into motion. Why? The question why, he says, why is the only source of real power without why you are powerless? He's talking about cause and effect, and he says it specifically. Causality, he calls the only real truth. And this is the villain. The words of truth come through one of the... It's a big technique in Hollywood, too. The words of truth are spoken by the villain in the movie or in the series. Okay? But if you listen... And there is a twist, a dark twist to what he says. He says, free will is like an illusion. No, it is not. That's where the dark occultist is trying to trip up the heroes. There are both, free will and natural law. He tries to say free will 
the, the Morpheus character says to him, everything starts with choice. And Morpheus is correct. Our choices set that causality into motion before it becomes an effect. And the Merovingian tries to tell him, no, there is no free will. That's where the dark occultist will give you the bulk of truth and then poison it with that one thing he wants to get you to accept. Okay? So the, the next thing that needs to be understood is the two planes. All right? There's the plane of effects and then there's the plane of causes. No power to affect any change lies on the plane of effects, which is the physical manifested reality. Again, what already is, nothing can be done about. What already is, you cannot change. You cannot change the past. You can change what it is starting now and make sure that it gets changed in the future. But right now, what is, is the truth, and all you can do is accept that or reject it. You can't change the past. So the physical world that is manifested up to this point happened because of things that occurred in the past. The causes happened in the past. Nothing you can do about that right now. Okay? The plane of effects or the physical world is where manifested realities have already occurred, have already taken shape, have already formed due to their underlying causal factors. The plane of effects constitutes that which has already occurred. As such, no power to affect change lies here because that which has already occurred cannot unoccur. That which has occurred can't undo itself. It happened. It's already done. It has become that which is, or truth. Human consciousness seems to be trapped upon the plane of effects, meaning that humanity as a whole remains ignorant of the underlying causes, causes which they themselves have set into motion and which lead to self-inflicted suffering in their lives. So if you're trapped at this level, what you're doing is you're looking at the symptoms and you're stuck looking at the symptoms. Okay, This is everybody... Oh, there's a political solution to this. We need to vote in the right people. Oh, there's a financial solution to this. We just need to set the right monetary policy. No, there's a scientific solution to this. And technological advancements are going to be made that suddenly save ourselves and make the world any different. And they think all of this is going to be done while slavery is still in place. Well, again, good luck with that. Let me know how it works out. Okay? I speak at free energy related events. I work with the Tesla Science Foundation. I speak at MUFON-related events to talk about disclosure of extraterrestrial presence, okay? Both of these communities don't understand. The things that they say they want are impossible. And I'm going to start talking about them in, in this way more openly, you know, because I've kind of like uh, given them some soft teachings, and I think they need to hear it a little bit more harshly because both of these communities are not talking about morality, to the extent that they need to. They think, we're going to have free energy, but nothing's going to change as far as the social structure of the world goes. We'll just develop free energy, and that'll magically save us. We'll still have slavery, but free energy will be here, and the world will be a magically better place. The UFO community, they often think, oh, we're going to get disclosure. They're going to come out and tell us everything we know about other intelligences that are out there in the galaxy and in the universe with us, Okay. And they think they're going to get that in a climate of slavery. Well, good luck with all those things. you got to take down the existing structure first. Okay? People think, oh, we got to build the new world while the old one decays. You have to destroy the existing power structure with the power of truth before anything new is going to grow here. Because this place is a garden full of weeds of poisoned ideologies and completely erroneous belief systems that have no bearing on truth whatsoever and cannot get us what we say we want. Until that cha those, those thoughts are changed, don't expect the results you want. So to the free energy movement, I say you're never going to get free energy in a climate of slavery. To the UFO community, I say you will never get disclosure in a climate of slavery. Slavery has to end first. Then you could get what you say you want. So, again, no power to affect any change lies in the world of effects. Cannot be done. You are rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while it sinks. You're not creating any change doing those things. 
Because no, the underlying causes aren't changing. And the underlying causes are how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. And no one wants to look at that. They want to think all those things can stay in place and I can magically get what I want. I want to keep my hand over the fire, but I don't want it to burn and blister. Well, enjoy. See, find out what you get when you do that. Because that's what we're doing when it comes to natural law. So let's look at the plane of causality. This is the other plane. This is the mental realm, the mental world. Again, according to the law of mentalism, the first principle of natural law, everything that manifests must first manifest in mind before it can manifest physically. So again, if the plane of causality is the mental world that's generating the causes in mind, okay, everything is happening there first and then it is trickling down to the physical domain. It is manifesting in the physical domain only after it has manifested in the mental world. The plane of causality is where causes are set into motion prior to those causes manifesting as formed realities in the plane of effects. <clears throat> the, this plane of causality constitutes the causal factors the why, which underlies and precedes all manifested things and events. All power, all power to affect change lies on this plane of reality. Human consciousness must move away from the plane of effects and to the plane of causality in order for human beings to understand the causal factors of the conditions which they are collectively manifesting in their lives. Only then will humanity be able to co-create their shared reality on a conscious level, meaning with an understanding of how natural law operates, rather than on, on an unconscious level, meaning that we don't understand how natural law operates. And I just look at it in a simple graphic, in a simple you know, chart or graph. This is the, this is the higher realm. This is the world of causality, the mental world, the why, the underlying causal factors, okay, that precede conditions which, which are manifested. This is where our consciousness has to go because this is where all power to affect change is at. In the understanding of why that manifested to begin with. So these are the symptoms. This, this line could be looked at as the diagnosis you have to make that diagnosis and get to the underlying causal factors that lead to the symptoms. Okay? The plane of effects, on the other hand, meaning the physical world, is the manifested realm. That which has already occurred, that cannot be undone. At least in the, in the present moment, you could start in the present to undo it in the future. But as far as the present moment and all moments in the past go, you're not changing that. That's truth. That's what is. Okay, that's already manifested. You can't change it. No power to affect, to affect change lies in continuously analyzing the symptoms. You gotta do that long enough that you know where the problem's at, you've made the diagnosis, now you can get to the causal factors and start going to work changing those causes, okay? Unfortunately, this plane, the plane of effect, seems to be where human consciousness in the aggregate is trapped. It can't seem to get past there. Even if it recognizes the problem, it wants to keep describing the problem, it wants to keep describing the prison. It doesn't want to look at the causal factors because it's afraid of what the causal factors are. It doesn't want to acknowledge the causal factors lie in how we think, feel, and act, and until those things are changed, the, the external manifestation cannot change. That takes responsibility. The final principle of the um, seven Principles of natural law, at least the, the formalized ones, are gender. Again, I'm going to talk about an eighth lost one. Gender exists in everything. Everything has its masculine and its feminine components or principles. We've already seen that when it comes to the human brain, consciousness, worldview, etc. Gender manifests on all planes of existence. Spiritual, mental, physical, everything. Okay? Very simple concept. What I want to briefly talk about is mental gender. Mental gender is the state of coexistence between the masculine and feminine aspects of the mind. Again, we've already looked at this. We looked at the breakdown of the physiology of the brain, at least of the higher order part of the brain, the neocortex. 
Our left brain hemisphere largely facilitates the masculine aspects of the mind or the intellect, logic, analytical thought, linear thought processes, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates the feminine aspect or intuition, meaning creativity, compassion, and holistic thought processes. This next section is what I call the lost principle. This is the eighth principle of natural law, which binds all of the other principles together. Okay, it is what I would call the encapsulating principle. Okay, it's the container inside which all the other principles fit very nicely and neatly. However, it's lost because we're not exercising it. See, we already looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven principles of natural law. And there they are represented by these circles overlapping each other. Okay? Can anybody see an eighth circle anywhere? You got it. Correct. Here's the eighth circle. And this might look familiar. You might have seen this somewhere. Okay? This, this pattern is called something. Does anybody know what this pattern is called? What is it? Not the flower of life. The seed of life. The seed of life. Okay? Now, what happens from a seed? It grows. It generates something. It creates something. A seed has an outer casing, an outer shell. Okay? Then if you're going to get to the inner core of it that contains all of the creative, genetic, generative material, okay, that shell has to be there and intact. You break the shell of the seed, the creative essence of the seed is going to be gone. Okay? Now, what is that principle? Here's what that principle is. It's the eighth or what I call the lost principle. And it's the thing that has to be present in order for any change to manifest itself. And it is not what most people think of it as. Even when I tell you what this is, I guarantee you there will be an inaccurate connotative meaning for what people think this means, okay? Here's what the eighth principle is. It is known as the generative principle, or the principle which governs creation, which actually is the causal factor that goes into effect and generates the result that we say that we want. But what's the real term for it? Who can guess what the actual term, what the generative principle of creation actually is? No, it is not action. It, okay, now most people will say it's love. I want to distinguish it from the concept of love, even as I'm going to describe love in this presentation a little bit later on. Okay? What is it? Procreation. No? What? Somebody said it. But somebody said something else. No? Who? Care. There it is. Okay? The generative principle is care. Now, this is different than compassion. People say, why don't you use the word compassion? Because that's not what I'm talking about. It is a different concept than compassion or even what I would describe as love. Care, and I mean care with a capital C, and here I didn't even put it with a capital C. I'm just putting it in all uppercase. All uppercase care. D distinguish this from care with a lowercase c. Okay? This means... What are you giving attention and helping to grow? What are you focusing upon? Because what focus you're focusing upon, that's what's ultimately getting generated, getting created, and growing. And this doesn't mean be ignorant of what's going on in the world and don't look at anything that's negative because you're going to feed that and give power to it. That's not what it means. Okay? That means you know what you're feeding? In that instance, if you want to do that, you're feeding ignorance. And that's what's going to grow. It's the exact opposite that the New Agers want you to believe that it is. By ignoring the negative, you are ensuring that more of it occurs. You are fueling it by ignorance. Ensuring that it grows and takes over. Okay? What care has to be looked at here as is... This is what you're giving your energy to. This is what you're focused upon. 
This is what you actually care enough about to do, to spend your time on, to put your attention on, to manifest in the world. That's what I'm talking about as care, okay? That's what generates our experience in the aggregate. Most people don't care about what's really happening. Therefore, it is an impossibility for us in the aggregate to change the direction of energy, to change the direction of consciousness, and ultimately to get what we say we want. That's how the real law of attraction works, all right? Here's how it actually operates. The loss principle is the dynamic of care. What we care about on a day-to-day -day basis acts as the driving force of our thoughts and actions. What did I say we need to develop? The heart, mind, guts, right? Heart, mind, guts, in that order. Care comes first. You gotta care enough to know, to develop the knowledge, okay? Then you gotta act on it and put it into practice. Apply it. So that's the order. Heart, mind, guts. Care, knowledge, action. Those are the steps, okay? And all three of those have to be in place. All three. That's what unity consciousness is. It's unifying thoughts, emotions, and actions. The three aspects of consciousness, such that there is no contradiction between them. Our thoughts, what we say, what, what, what we think, how we feel, and how we act are one and the same. There's no contradiction. That's unity consciousness, okay? Therefore, Okay, since it's the, care is the driver of our thoughts and actions, it ul ultimately can be seen as the generator of the quality of our shared experience here on the earth. Care is what generates the whole thing. Hence, it has been called the generative principle. Liken the heart to a pump in the body. Well, what does a pump do? It's a generator. It provides energy. It moves the life force through the blood in the body. In every ancient tradition, they talk about the life force being in the blood. The heart is what pumps that through the whole physiology and enables us to continue to sustain life, okay? The heart is the generator, it's the pump. It's the center of the being. As important as the brain is, which we just talked about the importance of it, the heart is ultimately what's generating the experience because what we care about determines what we think about on a daily basis most of the time and therefore how we behave, all right? So, the, this principle has often been referred to as the generative principle. Uh, is anybody familiar with the compasses and square symbol of Freemasonry with the G in the middle? Well, that's what the G stands for at the highest level. They'll talk about many, many porch masons. These are the exoteric masons that are given the teachings of the profane and they think they're in the know, okay? They're given the, the information, well, this only means geometry, it only means God, etc. okay? One of the things they'll tell you it means in, at a slightly higher level is that it means gnosis, knowledge, okay? Which we saw the meaning of in Greek earlier. At a higher level, at illuminated levels of Freemasonry, which are above 30, 32nd degree, they will give you what the real meaning of the G inside the compasses and square is. And it is the generative principle. It means genesis, creation, okay? And yeah, you can tie that right back to God. I'm not saying those things are different. And the, the forms that get created in the physical manifested world are geometric forms. So it is geometry as well. It's all these things. But at the highest level, it's the generative principle. That's what that G really stands for in esoteric Freemasonry. Okay? It's called the generative principle because that means to create. It comes from, the word generative comes from Latin. The verb genere, as we've already talked about, means to create. The generative principle is what we create through. And it's lost because people don't care. They don't have care. Hence, it's the lost principle, okay? Here's how it works, folks. What we care enough to put our will behind, okay? So again, heart, mind, guts. Guts is the will, 
the action, the masculine principle. That's what gets, gets things done ultimately in the physical domain. What we care enough to put our will behind, and that's driven by the care. That's the generator or the pump that drives the will, okay? What we care enough to put our will behind is ultimately what gets created or manifested in our world. The world is the way that it is because most people do not care enough, even if they say, they pay lip service, okay, and say that they want things to be different. They don't care enough to actually change it through their actions. Because when it, again, when it comes all down to it, and I said this in my New Age, uh, you know, uh, BS seminar or, or lecture, okay? What it comes down to is preventing action. Preventing action. That's what the New Age community is designed to do. They want people inactive because the dark occultists know that the thing that is ultimately generating our reality is behavior, as you saw in that simple four-part chart, that little you know building block chart that I put up there. Action is what's generating the reality. That gets generated through what we care about because our cares and our desires drive our actions. Okay? So most people will say they want things to change, but then when you say, what are you doing to make that change happen? Not a word. Silence comes back on the other end. Okay? So they don't care enough to change it through their actions. That's what the generative or lost principle is about. And until that principle is regained and people get out of their laziness and most of all get out of their cowardice. Again, in that New Age lecture, I'm talking about what it ultimately comes down to in the New Age movement, and I'll look at any New Ager in the eyes. They're cowards. Cowards. Ultimately, they know the evil that we're up against, and they intend to do not a damn thing about it. That's what it really, that's what it really comes down to. And anybody telling you it's different than that is lying to you. Okay? They're cowards. Period. And I'll say it right to any of their faces. Anything I say up here, I'll, anybody that believes in that nonsense, come and bring them to me. I'll tell them right to their face. Straight and open, just like I said it here. Because I don't care. I don't care about their nonsense. I care about what's real. Okay? So, I'm telling you, this religion has to go. It's got to go. If people are going to make real change happen, the idea that it can't be done uh, that it can be done without taking actual real-world action has to be purged from human consciousness. Reality does not work like that, period, the end. I, and I can't make you accept that. I recognize I can't make anybody in this room accept that. All I can do is put it out there for your consideration, and if you have some common sense and really, really think about it, you'll understand what I'm saying here is absolutely the way it is. Okay? Many people want to deceive you through these religious notions, okay, which is all about getting people to stand down and accept their chains. That's what that religion's in place for. All right? This next section I call spiritual currency or spiritual currencies. All right? There's two spiritual currencies, time and attention. Now, look, we can readily see this, right? Time is money, people say. It's currency, right? What am I going to spend my time on? What am I going to pay attention to? Pay attention. You pay for something, you get something in return when you pay for something, right? That's what attention will get you here. It will get you something in return. You pay attention, you're going to come out of here with a lot of understanding. There's two spiritual currencies, time and attention. This analogy can be very readily, can be seen very readily in the saying, spending time and paying attention. Whatever information or endeavors we put our time and attention toward, we end up getting something in return for that investment of these currencies. This is what real money is, folks. Real money. This will get you real money. One eye, moan I. Okay? If you want real money instead of the fake Federal Reserve nonsense fiat paper currency money that isn't worth the paper it's printed upon, then keep thinking that that has value. Okay? And people who say gold is value, gold is real money. Yeah, well, I ask people, what intrinsic value does gold have? And they say, well, oh, it's been traded with throughout time immemorial. People valued it all the time. Does that make it intrinsic? You answered my question. It's like saying, 
uh, why, why does that projector have intrinsic value? And you say, because I find it valuable. No, that projector has intrinsic value because it's capable of projecting an image, and if I want that task done, that's what I use a projector for. Okay? Well, what's gold used for? Can you build clothing out of it? Can you build a house out of it? Is it malleable enough to be uh, molded into a weapon of some sort? You're going to take shelter under it? Well, maybe if you have enough of it. <laughs> you know, the whole point is there is no intrinsic value to this. It's something that's bi the idea of it having in of any precious metal having intrinsic value, other than you know, okay, in a technological society, it's used for computers. This is true, okay. But I'm talking about in nature. You know, where would this idea of intrinsic value of gold come from in the ancient past? People say, oh, it's used as a medium of exchange, okay? It, money is not a medium of exchange. People think of it as a medium of exchange, and it's not. It's, it's incorrect, okay? Money is the limiter of energy in the system. See, people think of money as currency. Even the name is a mind control technique because it's supposed to be about, it's the current in the energy system. This is the current it's the amperage, right? No, it's not. It's, it's not the capacitance either. It's not a store. That's another thing people will tell you money is, what they say is real money. Okay? It's all fake. It's all fake. It's not a store either. Do you know what it is? It's the resistance in the system. It's the resistance to change in the system. It acts as the resistor. Because as long as that modality of slavery called money continues to exist, there will always, it will always be extraordinarily difficult to create real lasting change. So again, again, I, I piss off everybody. <laughs> Religion's got to go. Scientism's got to go. New age thought's got to go. Money's got to go. All of it's got to go. You know why? It's all religion. It's all religion. And the word religion means to hold one back, to tie one up and keep them where they're at as we're going to get to in a few moments, okay? So let's get back to spiritual currencies. We end up getting something in return on what we put our investment of spiritual currencies toward. And you know what that, if it's put toward the right goals, the end result is true money, one eye, okay? True spiritual vision, the ability to see, to unoccult something and see it for what it really is. That's what comes from truly putting time and attention onto the right things. This return could come in the form of knowledge. It could come in the form of understanding. It could come in the form of skills, expertise, and, and empowerment. But only if we invest these two spiritual currencies wisely. And let me tell you something, folks. That's what, why most people don't have any money. They got nothing to pay for it with. See, you, you pay attention and you get money. You spend time and you get money. I'm talking about the real thing. Cool. We're going to take a break in about five to ten minutes. Okay? So we have to invest our spiritual currencies wisely. We should seek to improve our quality of attention by placing it upon information that is capable of improving both ourselves and the human condition as a whole. G give me a heads up in about eight or nine minutes. Thank you. Such an effort would also constitute a valuable investment of our time. We should ask ourselves, what am I spending my time on? What am I spending my time doing? And what am I paying attention to? That's where you will find whether you're investing in real value, something that is truly valuable. If most of the time we're spending our time on nonsense and trivialities, and, you know, divisive things and TV and sports and all other kinds of entertainment and distraction, well, you're going to have a return on that investment, and that return is going to be low. It's not going to result in much money, real money, okay? Most importantly, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of quality am I getting in return for my investments of time and money, a time and, and attention, I'm sorry, Okay? These are the spiritual currencies, and that's what most people don't want to give. They don't want to give these freely for a return on investment. They don't want to pay attention to the right things. They don't want to spend time on the right things. This is a simple chart of how our quality of our attention, okay, and again, this is in the aggregate, but it's created by all the individuals, how the quality of our overall attention as a species will affect 
our world in accordance with the principle of correspondence, which states, as goes the microcosm or the microcosmic units, so will become the macrocosm, okay? So over here, we have a pure information stream. This is good information. This is information that is capable, that resonates with truth, and is capable of helping to develop wisdom or right action within the being. This over here is the poison information stream like we get from the mainstream media, from scientism, from the New Age movement, from uh, government indoctrination centers called schools, okay? This is the poisoned information stream. Now, everybody's going to take in some form of a mixture of both of these streams. What the goal needs to be is to purify. Just like, hey, you take in bad food, you're going to have bad health. You take in bad information, the output through behavior is going to be bad. So you got to purify. Meaning, if there's valves here on the individual buckets, these are called the individual people, okay? And they're all coming together with the quality of their water, right? What they're holding within their consciousness. And that's all going into the big pool called the world. Everybody's bringing their bucket to the pool, they're pouring it in, and then they're jumping in. And that's the world. That's the quality of the world, right? The quality of this whole thing here is going to be based on how much poisoned, polluted information was in your bucket compared to how much pure information was in your bucket. Okay? So there's valves over here. We got to shut this one off, this brown muddied valve, muddy valve over here, and we got to open this one up. Okay? If we do that, the world will be purified and it, we won't be creating self-inflicted suffering. We don't do that, we're going to be swimming in brown muck, okay? And generating all kinds of problems for ourselves. So, how are we spending our time? What are we paying attention to? Is this what we're doing with our time and attention? Sitting behind the hypnosis box? Which means suppression of knowledge. Hypnosis is the suppression of knowledge or the suppression of spirit, okay? Or are we going to devote our time to some pursuits of wisdom, which means developing knowledge, converting it to understanding by process it, processing it accurately, and then converting it into wisdom through action, through right action. And, you know, you got to read to do this. People don't want to hear that either. Okay? Reading is required. The ancient Romans had two words. It was the same word. Okay? They meant two different things in their language. The word was liber, L-I-B-E-R. Liber meant free, as in not a slave. A free being would be described as liber, free. It's the basis of the English word liberty, 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 freedom. Okay? They had the same word also meant a different concept. So the word liber didn't just mean free. If it was used in a different context, does anybody know what else the word liber meant? L-I-B-E-R meant in Latin? Book. It meant book. Does that tell us something? They associated the word, the Latin word for book also meant free in their language. Okay? And again, liber is the basis for the word library. Okay? Liberary. Okay? Where you can go to become free if you read the right books. You know? And again, the world is our library now. You know, we've reunited all the parts of the big library that were cast to the four corners of the earth. The mystery traditions are available at your fingertips now, which hasn't been the case at any time in human history. And what are we doing? We're playing Farmville on Facebook. <laughs> you know? So we have to ask ourselves, what are we spending our spiritual currency on? And we, are we investing it wisely for a return of real money, which is actually spiritual enlightenment? I'm going to uh, take a quick break right there, and we'll pick it up with the next section in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, right back here to continue. Thank you. So uh, natural law has been called many different uh, things in different traditions throughout the world at different times in history. Let's look at what some people have called it. 
Uh, it's been called the law of cause and effect, or the laws of cause and effect. And there's a scientific connotation to this concept of cause and effect too. Even scientists will say an effect invariably follows a cause. And they'll also say things like for every action, there is an equal, there exists an equal and opposing reaction. So there's a consequence when an action is taken. In the uh, more uh, new age circles, you've he heard it uh, um, referred to as the law or laws of attraction. Okay, I call this presentation the real law of attraction. So, uh, however, there are some uh, good things that uh, the New Age community, I, and I don't tell you it's all bad, I don't make that blanket statement, okay? It is a religion in, in many respects, but however, there are some truths embedded in it that can be taken on their own and, you know, uh, that can be, value can be gleaned from. So one of those sayings is, the energy that we emit is the energy that we attract. This is true. What we're putting out into the universe is what we're getting in return from the universe and what we're creating in our reality. Uh, energy flows where attention goes. I just talked about this in the last section. What we put our attention on is what ultimately gets manifested in the world. As you think, feel, and act, so you shall be. You know, some of the um, teachers of uh, different variants of law of attraction teachings have only put the first part in that. As you think, so you will be. No. As you think, feel, and act, so you will be. And most of all, as you act, so you will be. Most of all, okay? So it's been called karma. It's been called moral law, as I talked about before. And this is, you know, uh, captured beautifully by the phrase, what we sow, we reap. The seeds, the seeds that you scatter, that's what's going to grow, and that's the fruit that you're going to, to harvest. So... A uh, very accurate way of looking at it. Uh, again, it's been called consequentialism. That's another thing I could put into this chart. In other words, that there is free will, but there is no free will without consequence. That's called consequentialism. That would be another very accurate way of referring to natural law. And finally, the golden rule, it's been called. Okay, And it's been stated in the affirmative as do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. I find this much more powerfully stated in the negative, or what I call the apophatic variant, and we'll talk about what apophatic and apophysis means in a few moments. Uh, I think it would have been much less ambiguous, the golden rule, if it was said like this. Do not do to others as you would prefer not to have done unto you. Now it, the ambiguity goes away, because people want to be treated slightly differently. You know, hey, a, a masochist might uh, might want to get beaten by a sadist, okay? But that doesn't mean, uh, you know, do, do that to others because you like it. But people like know what they don't want. They don't want their rights taken. They don't want their property taken or, or damaged. They don't want to be harmed in their person, you know? They don't want any of those things. They don't want to be lied to. They don't want to be deceived. So don't do those things to other people. So let's jump into the, this is the heart of the presentation here. It's how natural law actually works in our lives. What are its expressions? How can we come to understand how this operates? There are ways of knowing, and they're, they, they are, they're through these expressions of natural law. So we defined what natural law is. We talked about the underlying principles that it's based upon. Now we are going to talk about how it works in our lives, okay? So we're going to build a chart of the natural law expressions in a moment. What these expressions are, are the recognizable workings in our life. And they take place through five basic expressions. Each of the five expressions of natural law have a positive aspect and a negative aspect. So that gives us a total of 10 overall natural law expressions. And we're going to build a chart regarding these expressions, okay? So here's the expression, and then there's a positive aspect to the expression, and there's a negative aspect to the expression. The first expression of natural law is known as, and again, this is what I call these things. It's, and there's no hard and fast rules, it's just terminology. It's jargon to try to explain them in words, okay? These are unseen concepts and laws in, human, in reality in nature, in the nature of the universe. 
Okay, these are just English word terms that I'm applying to these concepts, okay? So the first principle of natural law I call the generative polarity. Or in other words, this is the force or energy that we are using at the base level to start the process of creation. Or you could say of co-creation, okay? We're co-creating the reality that we experience with the laws of nature. So you could look at the first uh, principle, uh, first expression of natural law, which is the generative polarity, as the force that we use to set all of the other events which are to come, which are to manifest in our lives, into motion. Or in other words, what we use, the force that we use to generate or create the quality of our experience. That's the generative polarity. The positive expression of the generative polarity is love. Now, this is not what many people think of as love, okay? It's not familial love. It's not relationship love. It's not Hollywood movie variant of love. It's not romance novel variant of love, okay? I call love consciousness. It, love is the force which helps us to expand consciousness and become open to truth if we are in it. If we are in that vibratory energy, we become open to truth, all right? So here's what it looks like visually. I try to put a visual aspect to all of these concepts, okay? And people would think I'm going to put two people together kissing or hugging or something like that, okay? Love is inside each individual if it's present, okay? It doesn't depend on any other person. You can express love with another person, and there's no problem with that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a great thing if it's present in your life. The capital L, capital O, capital V, capital E definition of love that I'm giving here is not that. It is this force that opens up our consciousness. It's the flowering expression of consciousness, okay? So how I word this is the positive aspect of the generative polarity, the first expression of natural law, is love. In regard to natural law, Love should be seen as the expansive force for consciousness. It is the force which helps us to become open to truth and expand our awareness. That's the connotation that I'm giving for the concept called love here. Okay, that's the positive expression of the, the creative polarity. Now, the negative expression of the, create, of the creative polarity is the exact opposite of love. So people will automatically think, well, that's hate, and it is not. Because the thing that puts consciousness in a box and prevents it from growing and keeps it where it's at is what? Fear. There it is, fear. Fear is the basis for unconsciousness. You cannot be unconscious of anything in particular unless you fear it. Okay, that's what shuts consciousness down. And here's my visual for it. Fear. I don't want to look at that. That's too horrible for me to contemplate. That can't be true. I don't want that to be true. That's all fear. Okay? The negative aspect of the generative polarity is fear. Fear is the contractive force for consciousness. Fear is the force which influences us to become closed to the truth, and it is the force which ultimately shuts down our awareness. That's why so many people are unconscious, because they are fearful. They are fearful of the responsibility that comes with knowledge, and most of all, they are fearful of having to act based upon knowledge, because that requires courage. The second natural law expression is the initiating expression, what I call the initiating expression, just my term for it, okay? The initiating expression is the first stage of tangible and recognizable results which we produce in our lives after we have, quote unquote, set the ball rolling, okay? Set the dynamic in motion uh, by choosing between the generative polarities of either love or fear, all right? So, we choose love and something starts 
to happen. We become open to truth, right? Well, love is the expansive force for consciousness that opens our minds to the truth and awareness. So what do we gain as a result of accepting or, or existing in the vibratory energy called love? We gain knowledge, which is the acceptance of truth. Since love opens us up to truth, knowledge is its reception. It is the receiving of truth. We come to know, okay? So that's how it starts. I call this the initiating expression. Now, of course, there's a negative initiating expression if we are existing in the vibratory dynamic of fear. That would be the opposite of knowledge. What is it? Ignorance. Ignorance, right. Okay, now, this is what I put forward as knowledge. This is my imagery for knowledge. Okay? Uh, that's a being who knows themselves. You know, and as the mystery traditions of, uh, of Greece put forward uh, at the Delphic Oracle, know the self and you will know the universe. In other words, know the microcosm and you will know the macrocosm. Know thyself. The positive aspect of this initiating expression is knowledge or the acceptance of truth. Knowledge positively influences the quality of our lives because it positively influences our decision-making processes that lead to understanding in every area of our lives. You want to know how something works and ultimately create something good? You have to have knowledge. You want to know how a car works? Keep it running in good order. You have to have knowledge. You want to know how a computer works? Keep it running in good order. You have to have knowledge. You want to know how the human psyche works and keep it running in good, good order so the conditions on earth manifest the way you want them to manifest? you got to have knowledge. Not getting out of this condition without learning. Learning is the key. It's the answer. That, it, knowledge is, is the answer. And people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. They want to think, we're magically going to manifest the, con the de desired conditions that we say we want without learning a thing. It doesn't work that way. So, again, the negative initiating expression is ignorance. Ignorance is the refusal of truth. It is the refusal to gain knowledge. Okay? Because we are in fear. So here's what I put <laughs> as the image for ignorance. You know? The population that is hypnotized, that wants to keep paying attention to nonsense and trivialities, feed themselves tons of GMO food that is crap for the physiology, you know? Pay attention to distraction, entertainment, mainstream news and media, you know. Uh, it's all there to just shut the consciousness down and keep people in a depressed uh, psychological state and keep them in a state of psychological infancy. The negative aspect of the initiating expression of natural law is ignorance or the refusal of truth. Ignorance negatively influences the quality of our lives because it negatively influences these decision-making processes that lead to understanding in every area of our lives. If you're ignorant about how anything works, you can't create the desired condition. It's just not possible. It's important to remember, again, that ignorance should be distinguished from nescience, which means not knowing because necessary information is not present or was unattainable. Ignorance, on the other hand, means not knowing even though necessary information is present because that information has been willfully refused or disregarded. And again, to keep us in ignorance, they don't need to hide the information anymore because it's not hidden anymore. It's out. And it, once again, it's available at your fingertips for free if you have the desire to take it in. But now, the, 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 the manipulation mechanism that is used is dissuade people from looking at it. Provide endless entertainment, provide endless amusement, provide endless distraction, and say there's nothing to any of that stuff. That's just some old crazy religion that you don't need to understand. It's no different than any other religion believing that natural law exists. Okay? That's what people will insist on telling you. So people will be dissuaded from ever looking into it, and they'll disregard it of their own choice. Thomas Jefferson said that if an, a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Freedom and ignorance are antitheses of each other that can never coexist simultaneously. That is an impossibility in natural law. 
I'm going to put up a couple other quotes on ignorance. Samuel Adams said, No people will tamely surrender their liberties, nor can any be easily subdued. When knowledge is diffused, that means it's everywhere present, and virtue is preserved, meaning morality. On the contrary, when people are universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, meaning purely selfish and only worried about themselves, they will sink under their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders, meaning the society will turn inward on itself and collapse and destroy itself just based on the fact alone that the population is ignorant and they are ensconced in uh, moral relativism and um, other forms of debauchery and just uh, self-pleasure as their highest virtue, their highest uh, desire. Socrates said that the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance. And this is a quote I'd like to be remembered for. Willful ignorance in the presence of knowledge is the measure of a bad person. And people will say that's extremely harsh. That's true. That doesn't make the statement untrue. The statement is true as well. It is a harsh statement. See, people in my family will ask me, why don't, why don't you have anything to do with me anymore? I've deliberately cut off many members of my own family. Okay? Because many members of my own family say, I know what's going on and I don't, I don't care. I don't intend to do a damn thing about it. I'm worried about me, myself, and mine, and I don't care what's happening in the world. Well, you know what that's called, folks? That's called a bad person. <laughs> let's not mince words. Let's not euphemize. Let's call it what it is. That's called a bad person. And I don't want anything to do with bad people in my personal life. I don't hang out with bad people. I try to surround myself with good people who care because they're creating, co-creating wisely. Okay? I tell, my, I tell family members who I've cut off association with, because you do not care is what makes you a bad person. I don't want anything to do with you until you start caring about what's going on in the world. Then we could talk again. And I'll welcome you back with open arms and forgive you. But not until... You know, you want to stay in that level of consciousness? I want nothing to do with you. I don't want to be around people like that. They're bad influences, and they do bring other people down. You know? So I'll still put out the information. It's there any time for free that they want to go and engage it. And I tell them all, anytime you want to ask me and come over and engage directly with me, I'll make the time for you. But until you want to do that, until you develop that desire, I don't want to be in your presence. Okay? So maybe, I, I don't know if that's going to be effective. I don't know. And guess what? I don't care whether it's going to be effective because I'm not going to surround myself with bad people until they decide I want to make myself a better person. Then I'll, then I'll engage them and speak the truth to them. But until then, I'll put this out there for all for free and they can engage at any time they want. You know. But in my personal life, I can't make time for that. I don't have energy for that. I barely have energy for this. Uh, an anonymous quote, I believe this was from some internet forum. I don't know who the gentleman, what the gentleman's name was, but it was a great quote. Uh, Ignorance is the root cause of all evil. And since only knowledge eradicates ignorance, it is our duty and moral obligation, there's that term, to educate ourselves as well as the masses around us. That's a moral obligation if you're in a position of knowledge. And once again, that's why I do what I do. I don't do it because I like people. <laughs> Believe me, Barb will tell you how much I like people. <laughs> I don't do it to make friends. I don't do it to make money. I do it because it's a moral obligation and for no other reason. I don't serve people. I serve truth. Truth is a force, force which I serve. And I bend the knee to no other. That's it. That's it. So, great quote on ignorance there. Great few quotes on ignorance. Let's look at the next expression. The internal expression is what happens inside of us, very simply. So now, we've started creating with a polarity. Something has happened in the world, either acceptance of truth or, or refusal of truth. Now, something's going to take place inside of us, right? So look, this level is that knowledge level. 
right? This is the base consciousness level. You could look at, that's the foundation. Remember that four block diagram, right? You could look at this, here's the foundation. This is the foundation that lies underneath the trivium, right? Okay, that's as, low, that's as deep as it gets. Consciousness or unconsciousness, love or fear. That's what everything is a choice about between, right? Now here's that first block, knowledge or lack thereof. Knowledge or ignorance, right? And you can see these polarities are like that concept of, uh, you know, uh, in in um, uh, the uh, uh, polarity um, aspect of the the natural law principles. Okay, there's one thing that's real, and then this is the illusion. Okay, these are two aspects of the same thing. This is consciousness, and this is its lack. This is acceptance of truth, and this is the lack of that. Okay. So they're, it's the same thing, but opposite in degree, which is why they're the same expression. Now, what, what happened after knowledge, or lack thereof? We went up to understanding, right? So that's what this level is. It, understanding happens internally, right? It's an internal process, all right? So the positive aspect of the internal expression is when we come to understand, through developing the knowledge and the acceptance of truth, that we are sovereign, Sovereignty is the expression, the internal positive expression of natural law. Now, again, underneath these, in quote, in parentheses, I always put what I call these things, another name that I've given to these things, these concepts. I call sovereignty internal monarchy. Internal monarchy. Now, monarchy means one ruler. Mon means one is a prefix for one, and archon in Greek means ruler or master. So internally, we each need to master and rule ourselves. This is our kingdom that we get to rule and know nowhere else. We don't have to rule over anybody else. Many people think they're the rulers of other people, but they're wrong. Each of us is a sovereign being. We're, sovereignty, as we're going to see, means that you're not owned by anyone else. No one else owns you if you're sovereign, okay? So here's my expression, my visualization for sovereignty, okay? Somebody who truly has the light, they have the light at their disposal, they're bathed in it, they're, it's flowing within them, okay? And light has always been associated in different mystery traditions as knowledge. It's been a symbol that has represented knowledge. This is the person who has the knowledge and has has gone through the decision-making and filtering processes with that knowledge to come to an internal understanding that they are a sovereign being. And I have news for everybody. Whether you know it or not, whether you are familiar with the term or not, every person here is a sovereign. And you can never not be. It is an impossibility for you ever to be non-sovereign. It cannot be done. It cannot be done in nature. Okay? Every single human being on this planet is a sovereign being. And we're going to look at what a sovereign, sovereignty actually means. The positive aspect of the internal expression is sovereignty, or what I call internal monarchy, meaning one ruler within. Internal monarchy, one ruler within. As a state of consciousness, sovereignty means that one has unified the three aspects of their consciousness, such that there is no Internal contradiction between one's thoughts, emotions, and actions. We become a being that as we think, so we feel, so we speak and act. And there's no contradiction between those. We're not torn apart from within in this state of internal opposition with our, amongst our, our own consciousness. Okay? Moreover, let's break the word sovereign down. That's where we're going to come to the real meaning of the term. Sovereign is derived from the Latin adverb super. Super means above. See, in classical Latin, there's no, there's no uh, V in classical Latin, right? There was no V character. Actually, if you wrote a V like that, it was a U, okay? And why a, a double U looks the way that it is. It's two Vs, actually. But that sound was U in Latin, if you see a V. There's no v, v sound in classical Latin. doesn't exist phonetically, all right? So th this, this uh, phonetic variation that we express as v, v or V in English in Latin was P, 
P or B. It was represented by a P or a B. So what we're really seeing here is suver, suver, okay? But it was pronounced in Latin super, like super. Well, what does super mean? Super, you're beyond, you're above and beyond, okay? It means above or beyond, that's what it means. A superman is one who's beyond an ordinary man, right? The Latin noun regnum comprises the second part of the etymological root of this word. Regnum, it comes from rex, rex regis in Latin, or regis. It means king. So regnum was the king's rulership. Regnum means his reign. It's where the word reign comes from in English, regnum in Latin. It means rulership or externally imposed control. Okay? Not, not control in the context, I'm going to control my emotions, I'm going to control my behavior. No. It means I'm going to control you externally by imposing my will over your will through coercion. That's the context of rulership or control that I'm talking about here. So put them together. Super regnum, sovereign, means above or beyond externally imposed rulership or control by another. That's what it means. Sovereign means not a subject to another being, like a king, like one who considers himself a king. And it means not a slave to someone who considers themselves your master. That's all sovereign means, folks. Not a slave. And why I say every single person here is a sovereign is because there is no such thing, never has been any such thing, and never will be any such thing as legitimacy to slavery. That has never existed, does not exist now, and never will exist. Slavery is an illegitimate concept. None of us are slaves. The condition of slavery has been imposed upon people, but it has never in history been legitimate, and it never will in history be legitimate. So there is no legitimacy to the concept of slavery, of the rightful rulership of another being through directly imposing your control through coercion. Doesn't exist. That's a big part of what natural law is about. We have to understand when we're saying this word, this is what is meant by sovereign, not a slave. Okay, we did a, a, a study where we asked people, are you a sovereign? Like 11% said yes. Maybe, I think it was 10 or 11%. Which I, I thought was almost encouraging that one in 10 people knew that they were sovereign beings. It was amazing. But 90% of the human population doesn't feel that they're sovereign, doesn't know that they're sovereign. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't, it doesn't matter an iota whether you believe you are or not. I'm telling you it's an eternal truth that you are a sovereign and can never be non-sovereign. There is no such thing as someone else's legitimate rulership or ownership of you. Because there's no such thing to the legitimacy of slavery, and there never has been, and there never will be. So everyone is a sovereign. A sovereign is a monarch. Again, mon means one, and archon means ruler. So when people ask me, what kind of government do you want? I tell them I want anarchy, and I want, and I want monarchy. And they're like, how could you have those thing, things simultaneously? Because if you have internal monarchy, you can have external anarchy. See, we need to have the rulership within, and we need to get rid of the rulership without. This is the kingdom we need to master, and we need to set aside the concept of mastery and slavery in the external domain, in the, in the physical world. Sovereignty, so uh, a, a sovereign is a monarch, which means a single ruler who rules only the kingdom of self. Sovereignty is a state in which one controls one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions, and by bringing them into unity or non-contradiction or non-duality, attains mastery over one's own consciousness. Sovereignty could be 
considered the equivalent of true self-control, true self-mastery, true self-love, or true self-ownership. It's all of these things. And ultimately, it means not a slave. That's what has to be remembered above all else. Let's look at the negative internal expression for natural law, which is confusion. Now, confusion results when we are in ignorance. That's the emotional dynamic, the feeling that takes place within the individual. This is the lack of understanding. Confusion only happens in a lack of understanding. When we have not taken in knowledge, because we are afraid, we are in fear, okay? Ignorance results, and then confusion happens internally. So look, this is the, remember, here's the essence, that's the foundation. This is that first stage, that first building block that we called knowledge or lack thereof, okay? This is the second building block that we called understanding or lack thereof. This is true understanding when truth has been taken in and accepted. And this is the lack of understanding. Now, in that state of lack of understanding, we're confused. So there's no rulership within. Inside of us, there's anarchy, which means the absence of ruler, of a ruler, not the absence of rules, which I'm going to get into later. Anarchy means there's no ruler, no master. So if there's no master inwardly, we have a big problem because that means there's no self-mastery, there's no self-control, there's no self-discipline, and ultimately there's no self-love. And that results in an understanding that we don't truly own ourselves. It would result in the absence of self-ownership, which is what we're experiencing as a species, that other people believe they own other people. This is what I found as a picture representing confusion, someone who doesn't know themselves. Doesn't know themselves, completely attached to an ego identity. They're, they're, they're whole mind is all wrapped up. I believe I'm this businessman. I believe I'm this uh, banker. I believe I'm this lawyer. I believe I'm this doctor. And that's my identity. And if something goes wrong with that, there goes my identity. There's who I am down the drain. You know? So this negative aspect of in the internal expression of natural law is confusion, or what I call internal anarchy, meaning no ruler within. Confusion is the state of mind in which the being is ruled by fear and ignorance. Confusion could be seen as internal opposition, opposition within one's own consciousness. In other words, being torn apart from within in such a way that one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions are in perpetual contradiction with each other. A thought, emotion, and action are not in alignment as we think, is not how we truly feel and is not how we act. There's total contradiction and separation, no, no uh, unity amongst those three aspects of consciousness. That's confusion. The fourth expression of natural law is what happens externally in the macrocosm in society. When you have a bunch of people who are in either this dynamic w within their own consciousness or a bunch of people who are in this dynamic in their own consciousness, a state results in the society at large because the society at large is comprised of the aggregate quality of the individuals that comprise that society. All right? So if there's love present and knowledge has been taken in and, and it's been understood and we understand that we're sovereign and we're expressing self-ownership and self-mastery, what state manifests in society? Freedom. There it is. Freedom can only manifest when those preceding conditions are in place. It cannot magically manifest by any other means. If we say we want to be free, this is the path we have to take. Consciousness, acceptance of truth, and an understanding of our own sovereignty through self-mastery. It can't happen any other way. It's not possible. Okay? So, this is what the picture I chose for freedom. This is actually from the cover of probably one of the greatest books I think that's ever been penned by human hands. And I've read a whole lot of books in my life. And, I'm, and for me to say that, it's a high compliment. 
okay? I think I'm a pretty good judge of books that can impart some wisdom to people. And I'm telling you, you need to read the book, The End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke, if you haven't already read it. This is one of the, co the cover image from that book. Very rare book. To, to find it physically online, if you find it at a decent price, snatch it up and give it, give it to other people or sell it to other people. Okay, I happen, I had a physical copy of this book. I lent it out, took off. Forgot who I lent it to. It happens, right? But this was a rare book. I think it was only pressed so many, a couple thousand, and it was never repressed. So it's a single printing or something like that. Never repressed it. Now, you'll find that book for $150, $200 in some places, right? I finally found it at some foreign source online for like 20, 25 bucks and jumped all over it and I finally have a new, co a new physical copy of it. Um, one of the books along with uh, Larkin Rose's book, um, The Most Dangerous Superstition, that if I had to tell you, destroy every other book on earth, it would be down to these two. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that much. They're, they're that important. Um, this is the cover image from that book with chains being broken that were formerly holding the earth in captivity. I think it's a great image that represents what freedom is about. It's not about my freedom. It's about our freedom. It's about freedom for all beings. And guess what? Our, when I say that in relationship to the earth, doesn't just mean human beings. It means all beings, including the animal kingdom. So the positive aspect of the external expression is freedom, or what I call external anarchy, meaning externally there are no rulers. There is no condition of masters and slaves. Okay? So that's what anarchy actually means, the absence of slavery. That's what it really means. True freedom for all should be seen as the goal of spiritual development. Such a state can only manifest as a result of human society's adherence to natural law. Can only manifest. Not just will manifest, the only way it is possible for it to manifest is if we understand and adhere to natural law. Okay, so that's the positive external expression, what happens in society. Now, there's a negative external expression, and you can call it multiple things. You can call it totalitarianism. You could call it slavery. I term it simply control, externally imposed control. Okay, it doesn't mean, you know, self-control. It means literally someone outside of your own being is trying to control you and own you. So yeah, a good way of looking at it would be slavery as well, because control leads to slavery. Control is what I call external monarchy, meaning there's a ruler from without that believes, and wants, believes they do own you and wants to continue to own you as their subject or slave. And this manifests in things like the oncoming police state, which I wouldn't even say is oncoming. I would say it's here. I'd say we're already living in it. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's something that's happening in the present. You know, people talk about it as something they're trying to avoid from happening. What makes people think it's not already happening? The negative aspect of the external expression of natural law is control, what I call external monarchy, one external ruler the concentration of illusory power, okay, in the hands of institutions like government. Control is the pathway to all forms of evil and destruction. It results when a society lives in direct opposition to natural law. The fifth and final expression for natural law, how it operates in our lives, is what I call the manifestation, or the result that we create. So, again, here's the foundation for that little four-part building, right? Here's the first block, knowledge or lack thereof. Here's the second block, understanding or lack thereof. Here's the third block, wisdom or lack thereof, which is why we're in a society that's completely based in control, because we, we're drowning in knowledge and having a, a, a lick of wisdom, you know, or very, very little, I should say. Certainly not enough to go around, okay? Uh, that's the action stage or the wisdom stage, what happens externally, right? 
This is that top block. Remember the top white block that sat on top? We had the uh, blue block at the bottom, then the red, then the green, and then the white block. This was the manifestation, the result that we create. Remember what I, little question I put on the top of that white block? Who can tell me what it was? The manifestation. No, the manifestation was either order or chaos. What do we ultimately create? So the positive manifestation is order. Or what we would call all the things we say we want. Manifested goodness. Everything being okay. Not creating self-inflicted chaos or suffering. This would be we get what we say we want to get. And there's requirements for that. And here they are. There's the requirements. You got to be in this vibratory energy of consciousness. You have to accept the truth and develop knowledge. You have to have an understanding that you're a sovereign being and you have to work toward the manifestation of true freedom. Then you'll have all the things you say you want. Manifested goodness and order in your life. And that's the only path to it. I'm telling you that's the only path to it. Blanket statement. The, the human mind has a hard time with blanket statements. Has a hard time with always, every, without exception. The ego doesn't want to hear that. Again, humanity's greatest fear may be that the truth is absolute. I, th I would say an even greater fear it has is that the truth is singular. That there's no such thing as my truth, your truth, his truth, her truth, their truth. There's just the truth. And whether we align our perceptions to it or not, that's humanity's biggest fear. So this is what I viewed order as being like, okay? We have beings that are actually full of the light and they're working toward a world that is based in freedom, cooperation, knowledge, sovereignty, no control, okay? It's what I call in some of my former presentations cooperative spiritual anarchy, which is the natural condition of humanity. The natural meaning spiritual, natural condition of the human species that has been blocked from manifesting through mind control, indoctrination, fear-based, trauma-based methods. So that's what I call order, the positive manifestation, manifested goodness. It represents everything we say we want, and it only results when there is balance or justice Justice comes about through adherence to natural law. Justice can only be present when truth has been accepted in our lives and our behavior has been brought into harmony with natural law. Cannot manifest any other way. That's the positive manifestation. The negative manifestation is the opposite of order. Chaos. Chaos is manifested evil. I just put this as, you know, Complete disregard for other people, break down, me, me, me first. Knock everybody else down, get what I want. Don't worry about anybody else being hurt. Don't worry about anybody else's freedom. Don't, wonder other, don't worry about whether anybody else's rights are being tread all over. Doesn't matter. Let me get mine. Self-preservation is the highest law. Survival is all that matters. Even if I have to step on somebody else to get it, to make that happen. Yeah, it's an animal. That's exactly right, sir. That's exactly correct. That's not a human being. That's an animal. That's how animals in the animal kingdom behave. And again, natural law doesn't work the same way for animals as it does for human beings because they do not have the same capacity for consciousness that a human being has. So let's not start saying that's the natural order. No, it is not. It's the exact antithesis of the natural order. The natural order is just that. Order. It's in the word, it's in the phrase, natural order. What people are describing as the natural order through this utter nonsense concept called social Darwinism is, as I've called it before, psychopathic chaos. <laughs> and break down that word, psychopathology means an illness of the mind. Psychopathy is mental illness. Psyche in Greek means the mind, okay? And patho pathology is an illness, sickness. Psycho psychopaths are mentally ill. 
and they don't create anything resembling order. All they can create is chaos, which is why they want us to mimic their mindset, because they're just bent on hell and destruction to manifest, and they have to have our complicity and cooperation to make that dynamic happen. Our energy has to be given over to them by our mindset being made like theirs. Otherwise, their worldview can't come into manifestation, which is one of chaos and disorder. The negative manifestation, chaos, or manifested evil is the exact opposite of what we say we want. Chaos results when there is imbalance and injustice, which results whenever there is ignorance of truth and behavior which is in direct opposition to natural law. So that's our chart, and one last thing I want to say about it is that the, the manifestations or the expressions of natural law are what I would call, they're, they're unilateral. They don't cross into each other, okay? There's no such thing as, well, I've accepted the truth and I've developed knowledge, so now I'm in a state of confusion. It doesn't work like that. Okay? You can't go from ignorance to sovereignty, to the understanding that you're sovereign. You cannot cross this er the area of these charts. Once you're here, you can only go here. In order to get here, you've got to come from here. In order to get here, you've got to come from here, 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 and here. You, you don't get there from any of these, you don't get here from anything in this column. You don't get here from anything in this column, okay? Please keep this in mind. These expressions are unilateral, okay? Can't skip. Can't, can't, no, they cannot be skipped either. Good question. They must proceed in order and in the same column of expression. So you can only get to order through freedom, which comes about through the understanding that we are sovereign, which comes about through taking in knowledge of truth, and which comes about through staying in a vibratory energy of love or higher consciousness. The openness to truth. That's it. Same thing here. We can only create chaos, chaos when our society is bent on control, okay? Because we are confused beings that don't understand our sovereignty and think other people can legitimately own us, or rule us, and that comes from a place of ignorance or refusal of the truth, which is based in fear. Can only manifest that way. Blanket statement, too. And I will not retract on that blanket statement because this has nothing to do with what I think or feel or my beliefs. This is how laws operate in creation. Not a belief system, not a religion, has absolutely nothing to do. I, I did not develop this. I came to an understanding of it by seeking truth. I'm telling you, th this is not my information, never has been my information, never will be my information. There's no copyright on it, I don't claim it. It's eternal truths that have existed forever and will exist forever, whether human beings are here or not. Take it and share it freely and widely to anybody that's capable of comprehending it, because it's the only way we're gonna get out of this mess, okay? Those are the expressions of natural law. Now, when I say living in harmony with natural law or living in opposition to natural law, what do I really mean? Well, what this has to do with is knowledge. And we're going to keep going back to this trend. This thread is not going away, okay? And guess what? Every time I, I, I teach any of this stuff, whenever there's the new age community around or present, okay, and you'll encounter them from time to time, They'll insist, they'll even see the, it's like, uh, you can tell knowledge is becoming a bad word to these people. No. When you say K-N-O-W, no, it's almost like they immediately have an avulsion, <laughs> a extreme negative reaction, and it is fear, but it's mind control moreover, because they ha are being fed this poisonous untruth that there's not really any such thing as knowledge and that knowledge is not the way out of this prison. And I'm telling you, it goes hand in hand with religious traditions because they want you to externalize your power, externalize everything. And I'm not telling you, don't, I'm not saying don't have a model 
for behavior. And okay, this person, Buddha pattern, you want to pattern your behavior on the Buddha's life? Great. Live the great life. You want to pattern your behavior on the life of Christ? Whatever. And again, I'm not getting into this discussion here today about the actual historicity of the man Jesus, regardless of what you believe regarding that. I understand I could write books on astrotheology, okay? I, I understand that, that being may never have existed in the way a lot of people believe he did. So what? Whether Siddhartha Gautama existed in the form of a man or not, or whether that's an allegory, who cares? Understand the, the spiritual teachings they were trying to convey to humanity and then apply them in your life. Live by the, that, that ethic, that code, and great, okay? And believe, have whatever religious notion you want, okay? What I'm saying is what this religion called the New Age movement and what many uh, uh, official um, organized regional religions, okay, do, is they try to take the emphasis off knowledge. Because again, if you're not seeking truth and trying to develop knowledge, that's how this information remains occult. And that's how the control system stays in place. They want you to externalize your power to a deity or a guru. Once you do that, you're, 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 you're accepting your chains. You're saying, I have no power. Let me tell you something, folks. I'm not powerless. I am full of power. Why? Because I have knowledge of how things actually work. Nobody can tell me that I'm owned by somebody else and can get me to believe it because I have understanding of my sovereignty. If they can take that away from you by getting you to de-emphasize the importance of knowledge, of self-knowledge, they own you. That's when you're owned at that point. Okay? Knowledge is the way out of this. Knowledge, understanding, and then converting that to true wisdom through actions. Not believing in something, not accepting everything, not waiting on somebody to come down and save you, whether it be Zoroaster or uh, the aliens from Zeta Reticuli or Ashtar Command or Jesus Christ. Okay? You keep waiting on an external savior, you're going to be waiting in your chains forever. The knowledge of truth is what the Christ figure himself proclaimed would be the pathway to true freedom. Now whether you put any emphasis on even exoteric Christianity, I'm telling you, that's the core of all the mystery traditions, is that until you take in the light, you'll never dispel the darkness. And the light is knowledge of truth. That's what it has always been symbolized as and represented as. Okay, Knowledge is the answer. And here's what the biggest piece of knowledge that comprises natural law needs to be understood. There is a difference. It is a 100% completely polarized antithesis. These are diametric opposites that exist in nature. These concepts, right and wrong, do not exist as constructs within the human mind. Anybody who believes that is thrown completely off the path. They are, they are engaged in Satanism. Let me just say it just openly right out in, in, in a way that is completely unambiguous. If you believe there's no real difference between these things and that they do not exist in nature, you are accepting Satanism. It's a satanic belief system that comes directly from dark occultism. And once again, you could say whatever you want about believing that or not, I was a priest within this religion. So if you go up to a Jewish rabbi and you, you would expect you, he would have some knowledge of the Judaic tradition, would you not? If you went up to a Catholic priest, you would say, well, he has some knowledge of Catholicism and how it expresses the Christian tradition, would you not? If you go up to a uh, Islamic uh, um, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, yeah, right. You know, would you expect that, that this uh, practitioner of his religion, who's in, in the priest class of his religion, would have some knowledge of Islam? Well, I'm telling you, I was a priest in Satanism. And I'm telling you, the concept of moral relativism is satanic 
belief. It is satanic ideology. It's one of their, te- it's their second tenet. They have four pillars. The four pillars of Satanism are self-preservation is the highest aspiration and nothing comes above it. The second tenet is there is no such thing as the, the objective difference between right and wrong. Right is what's good for me. Wrong is what's bad for me personally. And that's it. And I get to, I get to make that up based on my likes, preferences, and whims. Okay? The third tenet is social Darwinism, which is an extension of macrobiological Darwinian theory. Okay? Social Darwinism, an oligarchy or a ruling class gets to direct the herd because we know better. And it's just our right to do so because our intellect makes us superior. And the fourth pillar is eugenics. Since we are ultimately God, since we decide what's real and what's not real, and we give that perception to the rest of the herd, and we get to decide what's right and wrong, well, we're God here. And therefore, we get to decide who lives and who dies. You, that's the four pillars of Satanism. And you know how many people believe that nonsense? A whole lot. Way more than people in the priest class of this religion, because they are propagating these tenets everywhere in human society. So many people are Satanists and do not even know that they are Satanists. It is a secret, infectious ideology. And I'll, I'll tell you a personal anecdote real quick. And I'll tell you who it is now, because I don't care anymore. My own grandmother. All right? Let's make it personal. All right? Okay? And I hope she sees it. My own grandmother, who it was, I believe was in her late 70s or maybe early 80s at the time. Okay? Oh, I think she's in her mid-80s now. And I don't speak to her anymore. Um, uh, I took a, I took a uh, printed sheet of paper that I printed out of my printer, printed it out of a laser printer, and I put a little piece of white tape. I taped a piece of white paper over the heading, the title of the document. And I asked her to read this. It had four paragraphs, right? And the paragraphs described each of the tenets of Satanism very briefly. Self-preservation is the highest law, et cetera, et cetera. Moral relativism is what we believe in. Social Darwinism is what we believe in. And we believe in eugenics. Okay? She said to me, well, I pretty much agree with everything that's written there. And I said, you do? And she said, yeah, that's how I think. I don't see anything really wrong with it or bad with it. I said, okay. I said, peel that little strip of paper off that I've taped to the top. I want you to see what the document's called. And on top, it said, the tenets of modern Satanism. And you know what her response was? Well, then I guess that makes me a Satanist, doesn't it? Not horrified. Not, oh my God, what, do, what is my belief system? What do I believe in? No. Well, guess that makes me a Satanist, doesn't it? As if it was just no big thing. And you know what? You know how many people are in that mindset? Hundreds of millions, if not billions, and don't even understand what it is because they think Satanism is something that it is not. They don't understand what the ideology of Satanism is. They, under, they think you have to be associated with the trappings of Satanism, okay? That you have to dress like, as if there's such a thing as dressing like a Satanist. Or you have to have certain things on your walls in your house or in your garage if you're a Satanist. Well, let me tell you something. Satanists are the owners of banks. They own hospitals. They own schools. Okay? Yeah. Certainly that university right across the road. And many people ascribe to this religion in their thoughts, emotions, and actions, and do not even understand it because they don't even understand what that belief system is about. They don't understand what that ideology is. They don't know its tenets. So, again, going back to this, if you don't know that there is an objective, meaning in nature difference, okay, between right and wrong, that is a satanic belief system. Morality, it's not right versus left. It's about right versus wrong. This whole left-right paradigm, 
The people, oh, you fall in with, with the left, with the Democrats or the right, the Republicans. Has nothing to do with any of that. It's a false paradigm. The, the thing that all of that's a distraction for not getting you to pay attention to and understand is the difference, the real, true, and objective difference between right and wrong. And we're going to explore what that is, because it can be known. It can be known, and most people will be shocked and horrified to understand the real differences between right and wrong, because they'll have to look into themselves and recognize in many ways that they are cooperating with wrong. And that they don't really truly know the difference between right and wrong. When you tell people this, I'm telling you, I told this to somebody in a bar once, which was a big mistake of even trying to bring up this, this discussion in that environment. But occasionally I even, you know, make asinine mistakes like that and think I'm going to be talking to even a semi-conscious being when you're talking to a block. Okay? So... I said, you understand what actual morality is, is true common sense. We're going to look at that term, common sense, and explore what it really means. And she said, so what you're saying is if I think that there's no really objective right and wrong, that I don't have common sense. And I said, yes, that's what it, no. I said, that's not what I think. I'm trying to explain to you that's what it means by definition, not by what I think. The definition of common sense is to truly know the difference between right and wrong. And I said, you, because I say that you are, are not fully in that state of awareness, don't even take it personally because m billions of people on the earth are in that same state of awareness. You're, you're not special and it's not a, a personal attack against you. And I thought this person was going to throw a glass at me. <laughs> Literally got so enraged because... She's associating the concept of common sense with that you are functional and can adequately perform the daily activities of living. And that's not what I'm talking about as common sense, okay? Having common sense about, oh, uh, I can eat, prepare my meals and eat for myself and wash my own clothes and, you know, go to work. That's not what I'm talking about as common sense. That's your every man's definition or connotation of common sense, we're going to talk about what common sense really is. Okay? A deep understanding of morality, which are the principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong behavior, lies at the very heart of natural law. This is the essence of it, folks, right here. And here's the difference between right and wrong, in a nutshell, about as simply as I am capable of describing it. All right? Now, we use the words correct or to, right to mean correct and moral. When you say, okay, what's 5 plus 5? It's 10. You're right, meaning you are correct. That is true. That is the correct answer. That is right, okay? And then we say, was was uh, stealing from, was stealing that money from Jim, was that, was that right? To mean, was it a moral behavior? So now, wh why would we use the same word, again, like the ancient Romans used the same word, book and free, okay, the, the, those two different concepts were represented by the same word, liber, right? And there's a reason, because reading will put you on the path to true freedom if you read the right books, Okay. Why would in English, in the English language, we not really, we have other words to mean the same concepts, but the word right means two things simultaneously. It means both correct and it means moral. There's a reason. Because they mean the same thing. Correct is moral. Correct meaning that is, it is in alignment with that which is true. Means, literally, by definition, if it is true, then it is moral. The more you are following something that is false, that is not based in truth, the more you are going down the path of immorality, of wrongdoing. So we have to come to know what is true regarding right and wrong if we are going to be able to correctly, with wisdom, choose between these two modalities of behavior. So, right again, it means both correct 
which is based in truth and moral, which means that the action, if taken, if acted upon, is in harmony with natural law. Actions based in it do not result in harm to other sentient beings. That's the definition of right. Now look at how simple that, that definition is. And, and think about it for a moment. We're talking about what is a right? Meaning, what do you have a right to do? And what you have a right to do is no different than what I have a right to do. What I'm telling you here is every single human being on this planet has the exact same rights. Not one person has one more right than another being. Not one person has one less right than another being. To think that anybody has more or less rights anywhere on the earth at any time in history is a fallacy. It is a lie. It is a deception. It is wrong. It is not correct. It is not based in truth. Rights are universal and the exact same for every human being. Blanket statement, absolute truth. Let the ego chew on it and deal with it. Okay? And again, the ego will have a hard time with this in many cases, with many people. They'll hear that and they'll want to throw a glass at me. So, look at the definition again. A right. So, when you, when you make a definition, right, this is a noun. Right? Noun's a person, place, or thing in the English language. We're talking about a noun here. You look up the word right, it's a noun, meaning a right. A right that we have to enact, to take, is an action. You have to start a definition with the same type of word. You're defining a noun, you got to give it a noun to start the definition. A right is an action. Most people will never even be able to tell you that. You'll say, can you define what a right is to me? They will not give you this noun. A right is an action. So is a wrong an action. A right is an action that if you take it, it does not cause harm to other sentient beings. That's the simple and easiest definition that anybody can give for what a right is. And I guarantee you, you go and engage as many people as you want on the street. I have not asked this question and had anybody raise, ever raise their hand or even contact me later and say, you go up to somebody on the street and ask them if they can define what a right is. Nobody can give you the correct definition for what a right is. Now, if you don't know what the definition of a right is, you certainly don't know whether you're choosing accurately between a right and a wrong, between right and wrong behavior. You can't. It's not possible. So, so many people believe that they're allowed and they can do actions with no consequence that actually aren't in alignment with natural law because the taking of those actions do result in harm. And they don't really even understand that. So let's look at what a wrong is. We're going to deeply look into what a wrong is. We're going to focus on what wrongs are. Because in reality, to even start this, right, what have we based this definition on? Actions based in it do not result in harm, right? That's the negative of another definition. Well, it's the negative of this definition. So you can only actually define a right by knowing what a wrong is. A right, technically, cannot be defined outside of the negative. A right can only be defined apophatically, meaning understanding what a wrong is and then stating that it is anything that falls outside of the parameters of wrongdoing. Okay, and we're going to get to what those parameters are. All right? So, I'm sorry, I, I want to focus on wrong for a moment. Okay? Wrong, again, we say this, What's five plus five? Nine. Wrong. It's not true. Incorrect. Incorrect answer. It's not based in truth. We use the term wrong to mean both incorrect and immoral. Well, that was wrong what you did to, to that person by hitting him for no reason. You didn't have the right to do that. Immoral means in opposition to natural law. Because actions that are based in it result in harm to other sentient beings. That's the simple definition of a wrong. Now, we can go... We can go deeper into the definition of what a wrong is and look at different types of wrongs, which is what I'm going to do in a moment. 
So this is the concept that is referred to as apophatic inquiry. Very, very critical to understand concept. And you have to apply this concept. What this essentially is, is it's a filtration process. This is the process of the, the, the middle process in the trivium, okay? It's, it's weeding through the inconsistencies and saying, well, is this inconsistent? Is this inconsistent? Is that not true? And you're, you're, you're setting those behaviors aside and you're saying, here's the behaviors that are wrong. Don't engage in those behaviors. It's negative. It's a negative process. It's a destructive process. You're taking away from the body of everything that can be done and you're saying, I'm pulling all of these out through a weeding down process and saying, these are all inconsistent with truth. It's called apothesis, apophatic inquiry. And that is to be delineated from what's known as cataphatic inquiry. Cataphatic inquiry means you're reasoning in the affirmative and you're not trying to weed down through a... Um, uh, a process of elimination to get to the truth, okay? So cataphasis or cataphatic inquiry would be equivalent to inductive reasoning, whereas apophatic inquiry or apophysis would be akin to deductive reasoning, all right? Rights are most easily understood when they are considered through apophatic inquiry or what is known as the process of apophysis. This process helps us to understand what a right actually is by understanding actions that are, which actions are not rights because they cause harm to others. They are the cause of harm. Here's what apophysis is. It's been called apophatic inquiry. Okay, really look this up. Understand what apophysis is because it's part of the trivium process. All right. It comes from the Greek noun apophysis, written there in Greek script, which comes from the Greek verb apophanai. Okay, so apo in Greek means away from or the negation of, and uh, phanai in Greek means to say or to speak. So when we put them together, it means to say no or not to say, or to say what something is not, in other words. That's what apophysis is. You're saying this is not this. It's the opposite of that, okay? So it is a method of logical reasoning or deductive reasoning that is employed when you are given a limited set of possibilities in order to arrive at knowledge, arrive at knowledge by way of the exclusion of known negatives. You're setting the logical inconsistencies to the side and saying, this is not what this thing is. That's called apophysis, okay? You are describing what something is by explaining what it is not. This is called affirmation through negation is another term that this truth discovery process is known as, okay? So what we're going to do is apophysis. We're going to do apophatic inquiry regarding right and wrong. So what is not a right? What are ways that people can cause harm to other people or animals? Ways that we can cause harm to other sentient beings. One of the first thing, so what we're doing here is we're going to list the boundary conditions for natural law here, for breaking natural law. If we take these actions, we are breaking natural law because the action is a cause which results in the effect of harm to another being. All right? So these are what are simply, I call them the natural law transgressions, which means sins or wrongdoings. They're simply harmful actions that a person is capable of taking to another being, against another being. That's all. So, of course, many people will get the first one. What's one of the main horrible wrong things that somebody can do to another person? Kill them. Murder them. Take their life. Okay? Murder. And, and I would distinguish murder from killing as well. Because occasionally, to defend oneself, killing may be necessary. But murder is always immoral and wrong. Okay? See, the fifth commandment in Hebrew... Do you know what it says in Hebrew? 
It does not say thou shall not kill. The term for murder in Hebrew is tirzach. The fifth commandment in Hebrew is lo tirzach, which means do not murder. Murder as a verb in Hebrew is a completely different word and a totally different connotation than the verb to kill. Because what they're saying is don't take life without any right to take it. Meaning that you initiated the violence and that's what murder is. It's the initiation of the taking of somebody else's life when you have absolutely no right to take that life. Now, if someone is coming after you, your rights, there may be times when you do have to take defensive action uh, and forceful action up to and including deadly force. We're going to talk about that later. But murder is the first natural law transgression. And if you want to go down to a subsection of this transgression, you could list it as a totally separate wrongdoing. I'm keeping it in the same basic category. Assault, meaning you're directly physically accosting without right the well-being, the bodily well-being of another being is also, it's like it would be you could consider it attempted murder. Because assault is something that you do without right. If someone assaults somebody, they have no right to commit assault. Never exists. The right to commit assault does not exist. The right to commit murder does not exist in any circumstance ever. Blanket statement. The right to defend oneself through physical force exists, and possibly in certain circumstances, the right to kill exists. But murder and assault can never be rights because they always are done by being initiated without the right to do so. It is the initiation of violence. All right? Rape is the second natural law transgression. Okay? You're coercing the free will of another person and making them sexually associate with whom they wish not to. That's rape. And it's always wrong. Blanket statement. All right? The third natural law transgression is theft. It is the taking of property that does not belong to you. Someone else you know, got that, that property through lawful means without hurting somebody else. That's their property for as long as they are using it and being responsible for it. And you don't have a right to just take what doesn't belong to you. Nobody has a right to take my projector or my remote control or my computer any more than I would have the right to take Richard's cameras. Okay? It would be theft of somebody else's property. It's not mine. And this is the problem. We don't understand property. As we're going to get to, all rights are property rights. We'll get to that in a moment. That's the third natural law transgression. The fourth is trespass. And that means going into somebody else's lair that they are using, that they own lawfully and that they're responsible for, without their permission or consent, and you're just invading their, their privacy and their space, and you're taking their security away from them in that process. And we do have a right to set aside a place for ourselves for our own lair. Okay? And to, to violate that is to trespass against somebody else. In, in their own property. The fifth and last natural law transgression is coercion. This is forcing somebody through the threat of violence to have their will comply with your will, whether they don't wish that to be the case or not. Making somebody do something that is against their will. Coercing them. And that's also not a right. Now, that's a small list. Very small list, right? We could add one more. We could add lying. Lying is also a wrongdoing. And I would consider that a theft of truth or a withholding of truth that somebody needs to understand to make accurate and informed decisions, lying to them. Okay? But essentially, these five are the overarching natural law transgressions. I challenge anybody to come up with a wrongdoing that doesn't fit into one of these categories. So far, I've never had one person able to do it. Any wrongdoing, any action that you could think of that doesn't fall into one of these wrongdoings. Voting. <laughs> yep. It, 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 I would probably categorize it as pure ignorance, but, uh, you know, I would say, hey, maybe, maybe you could look at it like that because that's propagating the slavery system indirectly. So, you know, you're actually, uh, you're not doing anything to help anybody else's freedom, certainly. I don't know if I would categorize that as a natural law transgression because, it, you know, it's, uh, 
it's giving consent and propping up that system. It's not technically what I would call an action, but um, it's more of like giving consent. Hey, you could say that is a wrongdoing, I guess, because you, giving your consent is tacitly saying yes to control, and that's ultimately affecting everybody else's freedom negatively. So, you know, possibly. Um, uh, but in general, what I would say is, uh, if you could think of an actual physical action that doesn't fall into one of those categories, let me know. Because that's a pretty comprehensive list, and it's only like, you know, six words. So, uh, now, what if I told you I could narrow it down? What if I told you I can get rid of five of those words and take it down to one? Okay? These are the wrongdoings. Let's try to narrow it down, right? Okay? Every harmful action that a human being is capable of taking is a form of theft. Now, many people will hear that for the first time. I've never heard that said. There is no action that you can take that causes harm to another person that is not a form of theft in some form or fashion. I challenge anybody to come up with an action that isn't a form of theft, uh, that is a, a, that an action that is a wrongdoing that isn't a form of theft. You won't be able to do it. I've put that challenge out on my on my podcast, say, email me if you know, you know, no, not one person. The only person, one person challenged it and tried to say, uh, lying. I say, okay, it's, it, that's really taking the truth from somebody, thieving truth. And whether you want to look at it as you're, you're simply dissuading them from looking at the truth too, deceiving them or not offering correct information, still you're taking away their ability to, take, to make correct judgments based on the availability of information. So it is a form of theft. Some form of property. Now look at that word. Property. Proper. Meaning right. Is always being stolen when a wrongdoing is committed. All rights are property rights. All wrongs are theft of property. Once again, I challenge anybody. It's an open challenge. If you can find me a right that is not a property right or a wrong that is not the theft of some form of property, please do it. Please let me know. Okay? Life is a form of property. So taking life you had no right to take, murder, is stealing property that wasn't your own because that was that person's life, possessive. They own it. And I didn't have a right to just go and take it for no reason. Rights are a form of property, meaning actions that you may do because they are in harmony with natural law and do not cause harm to others, I don't have a right to stop you from taking. If you're not harming somebody else, nobody has a right to stop you from taking a right, taking an action. You may perform any action which does not directly result in harm to somebody else. Okay? Rights are a form of property. Freedom is a form of property. Somebody doesn't have a right to take somebody else's freedom and hold them against their will just because they don't like what they're doing. They have a distaste for what they're doing or they want to, them to comply with their behavior, with their commands, okay? They want them to make their behavior comply with commands that they're being given. So if you really break it down, let's look at the wrongdoings once again. Murder, is that not the taking of somebody else's life? Assault is the taking of their right to remain unharmed in their person. You're taking their health if you assault them, right? Their homeostasis in their body is being, is put, being put under assault. And that's robbery. That's somebody taking something that isn't theirs to take. Rape. You're taking somebody else's free will to sexually associate with whom they choose to sexually associate. And therefore, that's a property theft because that's their property, their free will. Theft itself says it right there. You're taking physical possessions that aren't yours to take from somebody else. Stealing. Trespass. You are taking someone's security in their own lair, as we talked about, which you don't have a right to take. That's also their property. Coercion. What are you taking? Somebody else's free will, which isn't yours to take. That's a gift from the Creator, which belongs to each individual. And if somebody's coercing somebody by telling them, you must do this because I said so, and if you don't do this, I will come and do some form of harm to you, that's not a right. That's a wrongdoing, coercion. And it's a form of theft. Exactly. 
Sure. You must buy this. Imagine this. Great. We're going to take five more minutes and then we're going to take a hour, uh, an hour and 15 minute break. So all of these things are forms of wrongdoing and they're all ultimately one wrongdoing in different forms. They are all theft. Every one of them. There is only one wrongdoing. There's only one way anybody can wrong anybody else. Stealing. That's it. Every form of wrongdoing is a form of theft against another being and their property. A living being or their property must have been harmed in order for a violation of natural law or wrongdoing to have taken place. Any action which does not cause such harm is a right. There's the apophatic definition of a right through understanding what a wrongdoing is. And I'm telling you, billions of people, not millions, not hundreds of millions, billions of people on this planet do not know this, could not tell you this. Because this is it. This is it, folks, right here. This is the crux of natural law. What is a right? What is a wrong? And I was laying, I couldn't sleep last night. After we got home, and I never have problems sleeping, ever, ever. I'm just going to tell you this before we break. I was laying in bed last night before we went, I went to sleep for the night. Could not sleep because all I was thinking of is how preposterous, I told, I told this to some people at lunch. I'm just sitting there thinking about how preposterous and ridiculous it is for me to even ever have to utter any of this. The fact that this is not 100% pure common sense knowledge on the earth is so abominably preposterous to me that all I was sitting there thinking is, how could I be going out and explaining this to people? This is what I must do? Me, though. And I, I, I was almost, it was almost like schizophrenic in a way because I was just thinking, th I was waking up and then falling back to sleep and waking up thinking, where am I? Why am I here? And I, I'm the person who's coming out and doing this. And it's just so absurd and ridiculous to me. Some punk from South Philadelphia taking in the knowledge of the mystery traditions and teaching them to people. Me. It's, it's the most ridiculous thing. I, I can't even imagine it, you know? I still can't. I can't imagine that it's necessary, you know? That that's the position that our society is in. It's so profoundly sad that, I, you know, I can't believe it. And Unless we deeply start to understand this and propagate this knowledge to other people, things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And there's no reason for it. There's no reason to go down that path. We want to choose the way of maximum pain because we don't want to give up thoughts that we're addicted to just because the pattern has been there for as long as we can remember. We would rather go down the path to the grave and the abyss rather than admit we were wrong and just say, I need to give up this negative way of thinking. You know? I'm going to leave it right there and just say the bottom line to what this section comes down to is if someone hasn't been harmed, no wrongdoing has been committed. No victim, no crime, in other words. Many people insist, oh, there doesn't have to be a victim for there to be a crime committed. You know how many people are rotting away in a jail cell right now as we speak who have never harmed another living being? You know how many people? Tens of thousands. Okay? And there, there, no, no one has any right to hold them. Unless you've harmed somebody else, nobody has a right to stop you from continuing to take the action that you are taking. Okay? We're going to talk about some of those things in the last section. So let's take a, an hour and 15 minute break and we'll be back here at about 520.